You bet. I'm happy to help. A couple of things that uh, have been presented for me to announce. The City Council Subcommittee on Appointments is seeking applications from citizens who are interested in serving on the Fire Board of Appeals. Applications are due to the city by 5 p.m. on Friday, February 11th of this year. Uh, go to the city website and to the boards and commissions page in order to apply. A little bit of information about that then. The Fire Board of Appeals was established by Ordinance Number 1650 on December 12, 1983, Title I, Section 25. Everybody get that section of the Prescott City Code. Uh, da, 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 da. In order to pass upon matters pertaining to the fire code to determine the suitability of alternate materials or methods of fire protection, and to provide for reasonable interpretations of the provisions of the fire code. The board consists of four members and a chairman serving two-year terms who shall be residents of the city of Prescott, appointed by the council. The board meets as needed. So that's our first announcement. Second one is congratulations to Prescott Regional Airport. Official numbers are in and PRC logged over 311,000 total aircraft operations in 2021. That's fantastic. I don't usually get a lot of applause, so <laughs> we're feeling pretty good about that. Thank you. Uh, making them the 11th, excuse me, the 18th busiest airport in the nation. Can you believe that? Here in Prescott, Arizona. And the third uh, busiest in Arizona. That is the most since 2003, but not the busiest of all time, which occurred in 1997. I believe those are our announcements, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Tenney. We'll now have an invocation from uh, Pastor Dan Hurlberg. Uh, from the Prescott United Methodist Church, and then uh, afterwards a Pledge of Allegiance by Council Montoya. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we stand in awe of your wonder that is all around us. Your glory in the mountains, your joy in the creeks, your beauty in the wildlife, and your very image on the faces of one another. We thank you for our glorious home and for all who love and serve this city. Today, we thank you for those who maintain our roads, collect our trash, and watch over our parks and recreation facilities. Keep them safe as they work on our behalf. We pray to you for our first responders, our fire, police, and paramedics. We also lift to you our doctors, nurses, therapists, and other medical personnel. We thank you for their science and art of healing. Bless our mayor, our council members, and our city staff with your wisdom and discernment for today's proceedings, and bless us all by your ongoing presence in our homes and our very lives. In your holy name we pray. Amen. 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 Please join me in the pledge to our flag. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the, to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now we'll proceed with roll call, please. Mayor Good. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Roosing. Here. Councilwoman Hall. Here. Councilman Montoya. Here. Councilman Moore. Here. Councilman Sishka. Here. And Councilman Tenney. Yes. All are present. Thank you. And uh, we'll proceed with uh, proclamations. So our first one is a presentation and proclamation for National Downwinders Day. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you know what downwinders are, but uh, this particularly has touched my family because my mother-in-law, Dan Olson, Ann Olson was um, affected by downwinders. She was a downwinder, and uh, she died in 2014. And my wife could possibly be a downwinder because she was here in 1951. So it really could affect any of anybody's family that has been around for so long. So this, is pro this proclamation is recognition of National Downwinders Day, January 27, 2022. Whereas on January 27, 1951, the first above ground nuclear weapons tests were conducted at the Nevada Proving Grounds, located approximately 65 miles northwest of Las Vegas, Nevada, beginning many years of nuclear weapons testing there. And whereas when testing began, the, the uh, YS Atomic Energy Commission assured people living near and downwind from the Nevada Proving Grounds that the above ground nuclear test posed no health threat to the public. 
And whereas, despite assurances of the Atomic Energy Commission, <coughs> Yavapai County residents working and living downwind from the above ground nuclear testing sites were adversely affected by the radiation exposure generated by the above ground nuclear weapons testing. Whereas many Yavapai County residents continue to suffer adverse effects of radiation exposure generated by the above ground nuclear weapons testing that occurred at the Nevada Proving Grounds, and whereas it is important that we remember and address the lingering public health impact of above ground nuclear tests on the citizens of Yavapai County and the southwestern United States, and to remain aware of such threats in order to recognize and prevent them now and in the future. Now, therefore, the city of Prescott does hereby acknowledge January 27th, 2022 as National Day of Remembrance for American Downwinders. And further, the city of Prescott does hereby declare January 27th, 2022 as a day of remembrance for American Downwinders in Yavapai County. Thank you, Councilman Shishka, for reading that. Um, my name is Sherry Hanna, and I am here today. I want to thank Mayor and Council for giving me this opportunity to be here on behalf of American Downwinder Day. Uh, for those of you, I know many of you on the Council are familiar with the Downwinders, but uh, there are some here today. I heard several no's when Steve said, do you know what downwinders are? Several people behind me said no. So I have a short video to present that will familiarize everyone with what the downwinders are. As the Cold War intensified and the arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union escalated at a shocking pace, the need for more information regarding nuclear weapons became apparent. On December 18, 1950, President Harry Truman approved the nuclear proving ground, the Nevada Test Site, which was 65 miles northwest of Las Vegas, Nevada. The barren testing range carved out of the Mojave Desert would be home for the next several decades to 928 of the 1,054 above and below ground nuclear experiments conducted by the United States government. The testing finally ended in September 1992 when a moratorium went into effect. Before the moratorium, mushroom clouds were a familiar sight from the Las Vegas Strip. In 1962, President John F. Kennedy visited the Nevada test site. He has been the only sitting president to do so. In 1963, President Kennedy and Soviet President Nikita Khrushchev signed a treaty that required the superpowers to conduct nuclear experiments underground. This historic treaty banned nuclear testing in the air, oceans, or space. The first nuclear experiment in Nevada lit up the desert sky on January 27, 1951. The radioactive fallout blanketed not only the arid desert, but farm fields, homes, schools, factories, and businesses across the region. The wind carried contamination throughout parts of Arizona, Nevada, and Utah. People living in the affected areas were known as downwinders. From 1945 to 1962, the United States government conducted hundreds of nuclear tests which exposed citizens to radiation. Employees in the uranium mining industry were also exposed to toxic levels of radiation. In 1990, Congress passed the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act as an apology to individuals who developed certain cancers and other serious diseases related to nuclear weapons testing and uranium mining. Victims or their surviving family members are awarded amounts from $50,000 to $100,000. Free cancer screenings are available to qualified individuals. Thank you. Thank you for showing that short video. Thank you. Thank you thank very, you, very much. Thank you. I just have a few words to say. Um, again, thank you, Mayor and Council, for allowing me to come and speak here today. 
um, I just want to give a little more history. In, in 2011, the United States Senate voted unanimously to designate January 27th as a National Day of Remembrance for Americans who during the Cold War worked and lived downwind from nuclear testing sites and were adversely affected by the radiation exposure generated by the above ground nuclear weapons testing. From January 27, 1951 to July of 1962, the United States government conducted hundreds of atmospheric nuclear weapons test explosions at the site according to the United States Department of Energy Nevada Operations Office. These tests release hazardous levels of nuclear fallout, which was concentrated in downwind communities in Arizona, Nevada, and Utah. In 1990, Congress passed the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, better known as RECA, with broad bipartisan support. It provides one-time compensation to individuals suffering from illnesses linked to radiation exposure from the above-ground nuclear testing previously stated. As of July 2021, RECA has paid out $2.44 billion to cover 38,000 claimants, roughly 1,200 claims per year since the program was first initiated. RECA is set to expire in July of this year unless Congress takes immediate action. If this happens, whole communities will lose critical coverage, cancer screenings, and many eligible individuals will never have get the chance to apply for compensation. Currently, there is Bill H.R. 5338 in the House and Bill S. 2798 in the Senate that would extend RECA 19 years, expand the downwinder eligibility areas, and include all of northern, uh, all of Arizona, Nevada, and Utah, which are not currently covered, and expand the number of compensational illnesses. As time is of the essence, my prayer is that our representatives will come together to pass these two bills in a timely manner so there will be no gap in the current coverage. Thank you again for your support and concern for the plight of the downwinders and honoring me with your proclamation today, January 27th, as a National Day of Remembrance for all downwinders. Thank you. Thanks, Sherry. And now I'd like to, are you going to read the letter? Go ahead, Sherry. Pardon? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, Wade Cyril, representing Congressman Gosar, is here to read a letter of support on behalf of Congressman Gosar. Thank you, Mayor and City Council members. My name is Wade Searle. I'm here on behalf of Congressman Paul Gosar. Um, I'd like to read a letter from him um, showing support for uh, the American Downwinders. Thank you. Since 2011, we have recognized January 27th as the National Day of Remembrance for American Downwinders, and I appreciate the opportunity to have my statement read before the Mayor and City Council members. Military readiness cannot come at the cost of innocent American lives, but the atmospheric weapons testing in the West between 1945 and 1962 did just that. As the government developed weapons to counter forces of evil abroad, we inadvertently brought suffering on our own people. Arizonans became downwinders, including right here in Prescott, Arizona. As a result, downwinders are now susceptible to over a dozen forms of cancer and numerous other healthcare issues. I am a firm believer in a government of the people which fights for the benefit of Americans and when the government makes mistakes, it must be transparent, own its failures and care for the people it hurt along the way. While the government took this first step in 1990 with the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, its flaws prevent many from receiving the justice they deserve. I will continue to work for justice for downwinders and ensure the government completely cares for the people it harmed. We can never truly right these wrongs, but I continue to pray for, honor, and remember downwinders and their families that have suffered because of this exposure. As we remember our American downwinders today, I do so solemnly with a vow to continue to fight for justice for downwinders and their families. Sincerely, Congressman Paul A. Gosar. Thank you. for the Sons of the American Revolution, 
the uh, Prescott chapter. So do we have anybody here to accept this? Come on up. How are you? Good, good, thank you. Um, when I was uh, presented with this uh, opportunity to read this proclamation, um, there were a couple of misspellings in the uh, proclamation itself, and I'm, I was certain that they were incorrect. So I went to your website to look at the actual description from the uh, Sons of the American Revolution website, and I noticed that there was some uh, free genealogy um, functions in that website to review. So I decided to uh, kind of look up my own family, knowing that they uh, came from New England way back when, far before me. Um, and to my surprise, I found that uh, I had a direct lineage ancestor who was a magistrate in Prince Edward County in Virginia, um, who was a neighbor of Patrick Henry and served as a lieutenant in the Virginia militia during the revolution. So uh, I think with that capability, I might be applying. <laughs> so uh, thank you for that uh, opportunity to look into that. Um, this proclamation will be the 25th anniversary of the Prescott chapter of the Sons of America, uh, the American Revolution. Whereas the Sons of the American Revolution was conceived as a fraternal and civic society composed of lineal descendants of individuals who wintered at Valley For Forge, signed the Declaration of Independence, fought during the American Revolution, served in the Continental Congress or supported the cause of the American Revolution and independence, and whereas 16 presidents and Arizona's own Senator Barry Goldwater have been proud members of the Sons of the American Revolution. And whereas the Prescott chapter, Sons of the American Revolution, is devoted to perpetuate the memory of the individuals who, by their sacrifices and services during the American Revolution War, achieved independence for the United States and inspiring citizens to revere the principles that their forefathers incorporated into the government of the United States and encourage the development of historical research about the American Revolutionary War. And whereas 69 members of the Prescott chapter, Sons of the American Revolution, are organized throughout northern Arizona, whose ancestors helped the original 13 colonies to win independence for our country. And whereas on February 22nd, 2022, the Prescott Chapter, Arizona Society, Sons of the American Revolution will celebrate their 25th anniversary. Now therefore, I, Phil Good, Mayor of the City of Prescott, do recognize February 22nd, 2022 as the official 25th anniversary of the Prescott Chapter, Sons of the American Revolution. In witness thereof, I have hereto set my hand and cause the seal of the city of Prescott to be affixed this 25th day of January, 2022. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you very much. I'd like to say I, I do hope the mayor joins um, our organization. Uh, if he joined, maybe the entire council would join him as well. But I would like to say if anybody is interested in trying to determine if you might, you know, I, I'm sure there's a lot of us here in this room right now that uh, are somehow connected either to the Civil War or to the American Revolutionary War. Um, I am a member of both organizations. Uh, so all you have to remember is Prescott SAR, and just Google that, and, and it'll show you how to contact us if you'd like us to, uh, to help you do that. And I'd also like to thank the mayor. Uh, he's going to be with us on Saturday, February 12th, for our 25th anniversary. And just one point of interest. One of our members, and maybe someone here knows him, his name is Herbert Conklin. Anybody ever hear that name? Okay. Well, I, I decided to call him and invite him to attend. And he said, well, I can't. I'm in Virginia. 
and uh, he's 97 years old. <laughs> and, and, and I knew that. But what I wanted to do is on that day, I wanted to call him when I'm reading his name and tell him that the, that the mayor and the county commissioners and state representatives are here. And he was so vital to our chapter and to the community. And uh, we have lawyers and we have retired military and we have lots of people. And I certainly hope that some of you will also join us. Thank you. I have a couple more for you here. You can take okay. them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next, we have a presentation to Public Works Director Craig Dotseth in recognition of being named the Arizona APWA 2021 Professional Manager of the Year. This is very spectacular. Um, <laughs> I'd like to ask Craig Dotis and Eric Bay to both come up. Um, I'm asking Eric to come up because Eric is the individual, is my understanding, that put Craig in for this prestigious award. So. Thank you for that, Eric. Um, and I guess this is better than a gold watch since Craig's retiring, or maybe not. I, <laughs> I think I'd rather have a Rolex or something. But in any case, um, this is the 2021 Professional Manager of the Year Administrator to Craig Dothis with the City of Prescott. Craig has been with us 25 years. Yes, sir. See, like how I pulled that right out of the sky. Uh, um, <laughs> I can't believe that your tenure is coming into an end. We're all going to very much miss you and the work you've done for the city. But we understand that you have greener pastures in Wisconsin to keep cows on or something. I don't know what people do, literally. <laughs> you know, most people leave the Rust Belt cold nastiness behind when they retire, but you're doing your own thing, and God bless you. And, and all that. But, uh, but uh, all seriousness, we're going to miss you, and we wish you the best. All right. Good Any comments, uh, Mr. Dossett? From my understanding, they don't have too many water problems in Wisconsin. <laughs> Well, it, yeah, it depends what kind of a water problem you're talking about. Because <laughs> so, we have been there on our land before, and the water was far deeper than you wanted to try to go through. So, yes, um, this absolutely is, a, is an honor to be uh, nominated by, uh, by my peers and teammates and then to be recognized by the state chapter of uh, American Public Works Association to represent the state um, in this uh, for this award, so absolutely honored. It's uh, awesome. <laughs> and, well deserved. Uh, Thank you, and you'll be sorely missed. So, and my my success ultimately is a reflection of my team as a whole. Thank you. And then we have an update and presentation from the Prescott Downtown Partnership. Mayor and Council, I'm here to introduce Audra Yamamoto, who is the Executive Director of the Prescott Downtown Partnership. She's here today to give us an update on the organization and some plans moving forward. So I'll hand it off to her. Thank you, Tyler. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mary Good, Council Members, Town City of Prescott, thank you so much for having us here today. Uh, my name is Audrey Yamamoto, and I'm here on behalf of the Prescott Downtown Partnership. Let me find my clicker. Oh, here we go. 
Um, we've made news recently. We we know that. And we are here to present a little bit about us and what we're doing and moving forward. It's been a pleasure to meet with a number of you over the last few weeks and have a conversation, start, uh, start the conversation about what we're doing to move forward from where we've, where we've been. Sorry, I'm a little nervous. The last time I was up here, I was asking for a liquor license. <laughs> it's totally <laughs> outside of my realm. Um, so the biggest question that's come up recently is who exactly is PDP and what do you do and why do we care? So PDP is a business membership-based organization. We were formed in 1999 to take care of a lot of the projects that are specific to downtown. Um, our mission is to advocate for downtown businesses by coordinating and promoting events, creating partnerships, providing leadership, and keeping downtown vibrant. We envision a prosperous downtown business community that attracts residents and visitors while preserving our small town historic charm. Some of the events and programs that we take care of at PDP, we are the stewards of the Courthouse Plaza. We do the event coordinating through a contract with the county. We also handle the summer concert series, the nice lovely summer evenings down on the square and with local entertainment down there. Uh, we take care of the informational kiosks that are there and all of the summer flower baskets as well. Uh, we do host one of the arts and crafts festivals downtown. It's the Prescott Rodeo Day Show. That's the big, the white tent festival on the 4th of July weekend. Uh, we also take care of the holiday light parade and this year ended up with record numbers, not only for participants, but for people coming out to view and number of floats and it was a wonderful night and it was nice to re reinvigorate that one event that, that last few years has been canceled. Uh, we also take care of the Christmas mugs and we are one of the partners of Arizona's Christmas City and Courthouse Lighting. So this slide is a little busy, but I'd like to introduce, I'm gonna have you guys stand up. No, stand up. <laughs> <laughs> so our, our list of PDP officers and directors, we do have a number of them here today that came out to support me because they know I get nervous up here. Um, our president, Candy Hall, owner of Close Hound Clothing Company. Our vice president, Darla DeVille from APS. Everyone knows Darla. Um, our secretary is Tuesday King. She owns three businesses here in downtown Prescott, as well as uh, one in Scottsdale and some in California as well. Our treasurer is Helene Schaefer from National Bank of Arizona, lifelong banker. Um, and then our past president, Sherry Shaw, owner of Back Alley Wine Bar, Past President Bill McCleary, Spice Traveler, and all of you in um, downtown. Um, and then our board of directors. We have Matt Broussard, Matt Saloon, an MME um, entertainment owner. Dino Bolleri is a property owner downtown. Heather Burgoyne of Sir Pilates. Uh, we have Patty Zell, Great Circle Media. Jennifer Herbert, Superstition Meadery owner. Brianna Hinkle, Prescott Women Magazine owner. We have Kendall Jaspers, um, past PDP executive director, and of course, Kendall's Burgers, everyone remembers that. Uh, we have Autumn Klein here from Prescott Trading Company, owner. Jeff Meza, local photographer, amazing work if you've ever seen his stuff. We have Sadie Sardi from Sadie Sardi Design, Bailey Sanders, Born Brush, owner. Steve Szynski, Lost in Socks downtown, and Irene Renter, also of National Bank of Arizona. And as of eight weeks ago, myself, Audrey Yamamoto. Um, the reason why this list is important, it's not only a list of mo movers and shakers in this town, but really if it weren't because of their recommitment to PDP and their fierce loyalty to downtown, we wouldn't be here today. Like, oh, that's already said. <laughs> My peanut gallery back there. Um, so what happened? Fall of 2021. Um, just to briefly touch on this, we had a sudden resignation of our former executive director. Um, this did trigger an internal investigation and we were looking at some suspicious financial activity there. We've since formally handed it over to the Yavapai County Attorney's Office and it's being handled through the court system with them. Uh, one of the most asked questions that we get is did PDP do a background check? And the answer is yes, we did do a, P we did do a background check. Our hiring team did their due diligence, called the references, all of that. The one thing that we realized is that if 
if an organization had suspected activity previously but didn't report it, it's not public record. That's where our hands were tied. So what we did, you have a whole gaggle of business owners here and they know what to do when you fire someone. So what that did, um, we immediately changed the locks, passwords, things like that, closed their bank accounts, we submitted change requests with the Arizona Corporation Commission, implemented proper bookkeeping practices, were able to identify payments that were still outstanding and vendors that needed to be addressed, and we have payment schedules set up with all of them. Uh, we did start the full internal investigation, which we handed over to the Prescott Police Department, which were really fantastic through the whole process. And then we expedited the formation of our finance committee. So our finance committee is being headed up by Helene Schaefer, 40 years of banking experience. We also have Bill McCleary and Autumn Klein on that committee as well. Uh, we've gone through and we've rewritten our financial policy. And so we have it buttoned up and, oh, Oh, sorry, it's doing something weird here. Um, and we've basically just gone through and started doing things the right way. And with that, we're doing reconciliation between our QuickBooks, our bank statements, and our cash flow statement. And our finance team is also in the process of interviewing and selecting an outside independent accounting firm to um, start doing reconciliation with that as well. So what this did for PDP, for us as a board, uh, it really for forced us to rethink the way that we're doing business. Um, sadly gone are the days of the handshake and a good word, and we're recognizing that and applying that to our hiring process going forward. We're also really diving into our financial reconciliation. Um, I think that really as a piece of advice to any organization going forward is just making sure that you've got eyes on your finances. And then we're also um, increasing our board oversight and we'll touch on that a little bit as you see our plan going forward. Um, this also allowed us to band together in crisis and we really mobilized using individual talents and connections and everyone on our board really jumped in, offered to help, contributed, didn't ask what was needed, they just jumped in and started started working. Um, and then with our membership, we have um, been able to retain our membership numbers and we've actually increased numbers in the last few months as well. People are really looking to help and we actually have two new board members who are not shy to jump into the fray and help us out and two of them are here today. So PDP now, we're going full steam ahead. So one of our crazy uh, board members decided to step up and take the helm of PDP. Um, that's me, hi. Uh, 12 years Prescott resident. Um, for eight years, my husband and I did own and operate, built, owned and operate a business right in downtown on Cortez Street. So we're familiar with, with being downtown. Um, four years on the board of directors of Prescott Downtown Partnership. I did spend one year as a treasurer back in 2018. So it was a while ago. Um, and then since then, I've been able to start up, um, start my own consulting company, um, helping businesses uh, basically create their foundation. Some of the less glamorous work, insurance, permitting, licensing, um, operations, and accounting systems. So it was a perfect opportunity for me to come in and, and be able to contribute to PDP. Um, what I presented to the rest of the board was a strategic plan proposal three phases to rebuild, stabilize, and then move into a transition and growth period. So our rebuild phase, we are actually right now looking at rebranding. We have a um, creative team pulled together that's working on a new logo that we'll be revealing at our next annual meeting, which has been now pushed to April uh, 21st. Um, we are just um, changing the way that we're approaching everything, more of a partnership, more transparency, uh, we are um, starting email blasts to our memberships to uh, let them know what we're doing, give them a little bit more insight into our activities, and to give them accessibility to um, not only the executive director, but to our entire board as well. We are rewriting all of our um, financial policies, as, as you've seen, um, our general operating procedures, and uh, revisiting our bylaws and employee handbook. We have a 
policies and procedures committee put together for that. And we're restructuring. And um, the biggest thing about restructuring is giving all of our board members and all of our partners insight and oversight to the activities of Prescott Downtown Partnership. So with all of our relationships that we're moving forward with, you're not only meeting with myself, but was uh, one of our executive board members as well. So either our president or vice president, secretary or treasurer. So in stabilizing our organization, um, we're pulling together, we'll pu we're pulling apart all of the functions that PDP handles. So all of the events and programs that we have, we're creating playbooks. And with these playbooks, it's gonna define a roadmap, logistics, timelines, action items, contact information. Uh, we're gonna have budgets, any checklists or forms and training material that needs to do that. And we're gonna be developing these over the next 12 months as we go through a full season of each of these programs. We're also streamlining a lot of our processes. We are modernizing using technology in our favor instead of against us. <laughs> so we're gonna be just implementing some small changes um, along that front as well. And then we are reestablishing our community partnerships. Um, we're happy to be welcoming Councilman Tenney to our, our meetings, our monthly meetings. He'll be our new liaison for PDP and we're looking forward to that starting Thursday. We will we'll have our first meeting with them, um, but also understanding the partnership needs. And we recognize that we weren't just damaged financially. The former executive director did hurt some of the relationships that we have out in the community. And we're here to rebuild that. And we're, we're going to be doing whatever we can to, to get there. And then Really, the fun part is the transition and growth. Um, you know, the future is wide open right now. Future is open for our organization. We're looking at new events, some new fundraisers, building new partnerships, or taking existing partnerships and meshing them together, and also looking at new team members to help us implement going forward. So my last slide really sums it up. We, we love Prescott, we really do. And we don't just love downtown Prescott, we really are downtown Prescott. So thank you so much for your time. Excuse me, Audra. Audra, Hi. you're a very talented individual. Can you let everybody know, before you decided to go into the beer business, <laughs> what, your, uh, what, what your education and background was? Oh my goodness, Steve, thank you. <laughs> um, my, my formal training was in engineering. I was an um, aerospace engineer. I uh, worked for Boeing for a number of years on a couple different programs there. And then um, have kind of done a few other things. We've done catering businesses, serial business owner. So <laughs> <laughs> that's me. And I, and I do look forward. I know that we have a meeting with um, Council Member Montoya on Tuesday. And we're looking forward to sitting down and, and hopefully following up with everyone else that we haven't been able to meet with yet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you much. very much, Audra. We're looking forward to a uh, a re-energized and reorganized PDP that will serve the city um, even better than it ever has in the past. So we're looking forward to it. You certainly have a great plan here and uh, the best of luck. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Now we're gonna move on to the um, open call to the public. So, uh, City Clerk, would you uh, please read the uh, uh, conditions for uh, public um, comment? Yes, Mayor. Um, I just want to reiterate a couple of things with regard to our open call to the public. I'm going to read some information here from our agendas and from state statute, and then we will um, begin calling people up in the order that the cards were received. The City of Prescott welcomes public engagement and residents may comment and address council on matters not included on the agenda during the open call to the public. Speakers are limited to four minutes and the call to the public will be limited to 40 minutes in total. Please note, pursuant to ARS section 38-431.01H, members of the council may not discuss items that are not specifically identified on the agenda and therefore will not be interacting. So. I just want to remind everybody in 
not legalese. <laughs> that means that you may address counsel, but there will not be a back and forth dialogue. Um, if there is something that requires follow up from staff, um, counsel will direct us to do so. And um, that will be the limit and the mayor will let you know when you've reached your time limit. So we will start with Eric Bewley. Good day, council, uh, the new council, actually. I'm um, glad you guys all made it here and, and made it to uh, through all those processes to build us a new city council. I'm here to represent, um, with my wife, the Willow Creek Ward project, Willow Creek <laughs> Inn project, that we are uh, restoring the old Willow Creek Inn uh, restaurant into hopefully a entertainment center and wedding venue and to bring people into town. Um, I'm a longtime resident, 32 years. Many of the people on this council know me. Uh, many people in this room know me, and I've been involved with the school district. I've been involved in town, self-employed, hired a lot of people, um, have a dental lab in town as my main business and a couple other businesses over time. Um, many people in this room are wearing my artwork. And uh, so as we took on the project with the uh, Willow Creek Inn restoration, um, a very difficult project, it had run down and needed a lot of work, but we just wanted to restore it back to its original uh, glory, back to the 1877 days and stuff. And then, so we started on it <clears throat> and uh, got into it and then had um, the city uh, staff kind of come down on us really hard on so many things after giving us a direction that, uh, you know, we were grandfathered in and we took off with it. So I just wanted to contact you guys and let you all know that, um, you know, we had some problems with it and I wanted to discuss it with the council. So I asked the mayor, although we've never met, for a meeting and I got uh, turned down. And so I thought we'd have a second meeting, try. And then I got refused that you would not see me. But that was kind of interesting. And then so I thought I would ask for a collective meeting with all you guys and stuff to have a, a talk and tell you what's going on and what's happening. And that was refused. And so we tried real hard to kind of identify each one of you and give you, um, you know, a, a chance so that we could meet individually. And so far it's been silence except for one member who you know, graciously called me back. But then again, that was ended. So I feel like I've been canceled. I feel that this council is a cancel council and I don't have a chance to even express our opinion or let you know what the city staff has been treating us and how we've been going. And that's all I've really wanted to do is come up here today and say, can we rethink this and get a second chance where we can present to you guys uh, the events that have happened to us and presenting the wonderful building and hopefully we can get open because we've accomplished everything over and over and over again with this consisting moving goalposts that are happening to us that are, you know, breaking us down and, and causing us to be broke. So, you know, I remember, it's only been a couple years back where um, our wonderful law enforcement, oh my gosh, they had a fantastic campaign to engage the city's residents and to be aware of their surroundings. And if you uh, have somebody that's doing something, you know, that you can report it to the police and work together with the police to take care of the problem. And you might remember what it was. It was if you see something, say something was kind of a little catchphrase. Brilliant plan, wonderfully successful. So that's where I was when the city staff came down hard upon us with just almost unbelievable um, changes and things that it's like, are you kidding me? Kind of attitude that we saw something and we want to say something. And all we wanted to do is put it in front of your eyes and in your hands so you guys can see something and possibly say something so we can get this thing taken care of. And that's it. I just hope you guys give us a second chance to come before you guys and to present to you what has happened to us. Oh my gosh, it's almost unbelievable. 
as we tell other people, they're just kind of floored uh, with how did that happen and how did it go this way and how did this simple project of just restoring this old building turn into such a mess? And right now it is such a mess, not from our side. Uh, construction's going great, but just all the other things that have happened to us is just almost unbelievable. So that's my request today with the council and the mayor to um, rethink and give us a second chance to introduce you to the things that have happened, our timeline and the things that are going. So thank you very for much comments. for this time. I appreciate it. And I have one last thing, if I have a few more seconds. In this whole story, there was one city member that did us right. And I want to say thank you to him. I also want to say that I'm sorry to him because when we first came to the city, the very first thing come to the city, he put us on a direction that actually turned out to be correct. And then when we were descended upon by the rest of the staff, that changed everything. So, Mr. Worley, thank you for doing us right. You were correct in this whole matter, and I hope we get a chance to explain that a little bit better. But George Worley did us wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nancy Bewley. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, Council, um, thank you for the opportunity to get up here. Um, my husband's still a little punchline with me, but um, I just wanted to uh, introduce and um, explain the purpose of our discussion. Um, it's basically... Uh, many of you know the the long five month history of trying to obtain these permits, um, the permit, not even the certificate of occupancy. I'm just talking the getting the permit passed. Um, yes, we started off on the wrong foot, um, but we rectified a lot of that. We brought that all up, and um, I wanted to find just the last three points of where we are to get this even temporary certificate of occupancy. Um, going and that's number one a grandfather clause and that's what my husband was alluding to with mr worley um on june 1st when my offer was accepted to purchase the willow creek inn and we entered escrow i came down on my lunch hour from my dental hygiene job um to speak with planning and zoning mr worley said this is a wonderful place it would be a great place there's some history of where i was providing weddings that didn't go down so great um but that's all rectified Mr. Worley stated to me that I was grandfathered in unless I structurally made, unless I made significant structural changes in construction to the existing building. Um, five months later, Mr. Worley, we find the grandfather clause is in force. It might not be the thing that you all want, but it is a real law in the state of Arizona. It is a it is a statute that cannot be changed once it has already been in and I'm grandfathered in as an A2 restaurant and that's what I want my certificate of occupancy to be provided for um, you cannot change the change of use in the midstream of a grandfather clause I was advised by a professional land and use gentleman Mr. Um, Brian Greathouse, that of this very statute that is on the books. I realize it's not the most favorable thing for a municipality, but it is in force, and I cannot be made to be changed the change of use. My second point is once the grandfather clause is acknowledged and we go forward with it, all of the implementation of code changes bringing up to the 2018 International Building Codes go away. I do not have to do all of the things that they're asking me to do. I brought them all up. There's more protection, more safety than ever was in that building. Um, we took out 18 40-yard roll-offs of mitigated rubbish, dirt, um, not dirt, uh, dead trees and everything that you can actually look through the property that was never even acknowledged never even thank you for cleaning up that property mrs buley but 40 40 yard roll-offs to the tune of 18 of them that's thousands and thousands of dollars um the the third point is um the bridge status um the city built it designed it employed the people 2001 um stamped it engineered it um, 
and built that bridge. I was asked to, to get the engineered stamp approval of the weight capacity of that bridge so that our fire protection vehicles could go over the top of it. It is evaluated at the 75,000 pounds that was asked of me, stamped and sealed and in the presence of everyone's emails. Please conclude. Okay. So much hardship, much financial gain or financial loss. Over 200 emails I've had to decline from wedding wire and the knot because I'm not open. Um, HGTV's uh, Hillary Farr says she's a little bit out of sugar for the niceties of remodels and all. Um, I'm, a, I'm a little bit out of sugar. My mantra on the side of my building says love is spoken here. All I want to do is to be able to get this building back to where it needs to be. And that is three little points that are in their inboxes to be checked off and to issue my temporary certificate of occupancy. I appreciate the time to speak to you. I hope that we will be able to have a further dialogue on an adult, adult manner that we can get this resolved as soon as possible. Thank you. Barbara Jacobson. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, and it's nice to see some new faces here as well. I've lived um, in this area for over 30 years, first in Chino Valley and then 28 years in Prescott on the south end of town in a house that I designed and built to raise my kids in. <coughs> over the years, the fire department's been out to assess and evaluate the property, the trees, the brush that needed to go, and they've been great. And they're always telling me to do more, do more, do more. And they had the great chip program, too. So you can pile stuff. I mean, I've had 80 feet long, 20 feet high piles of things to be chipped, and that's all wonderful. But I've often feared the fires coming from the south, particularly when we have the winds from the southwest. So a few years ago at 2 in the morning, the engines are roaring, the ponderosas burning, a cabin caught fire behind me, and it caught the ponderosas. Luckily, the fire department came quickly. They set up their whole trailer. They were able to get the house and the ponderosas out behind. Fire truck was out in front, thinking it could come roaring through. And things like that can happen. Um, as a fire chief at one time told me, I'm on a dead end street. And in many of the streets, as you drive around Prescott, we don't have good egress in a lot of places. So if fire comes across the road, there's not a lot of help. Luckily, we have a very quick fire department if we're close to that fire department. Um, we are in danger. We have had higher temperatures, drier conditions. We used to worry about fire danger here. Mm, May, June, monsoon would come, things would be cool. Not anymore. It is April through at least November, and could be even further. Wait and see what happens this March, OK? So we have to be on alert, and we have to examine some things. The Indian fire that happened almost 20 years ago, we were really lucky. But the temperatures, the humidity, everything has changed in a lot of areas. Our fire season keeps our eyes to the south, particularly in June. and. Um, I also had to put a cooler on my house about six years ago. I never had to do that, but it is getting warmer. And you all know it's getting drier. I hate to tell you how many oaks I cut down on my small property in the last couple of years that died. And those things live through everything. Trimming weeds to 12 inches is what I'm told the city requires in the front of your property. That's it. I sent letters to eight vacant lots in my area and asked them to consider being firewise. We need to have not just property, which we don't require them to be firewise, but we need to have vacant lots also required to be firewise if they're in the city of Prescott. So we have to do a risk assessment. We have to look at where the troubled spots are, where there could be fire hazard, which is almost everywhere. I heard when Shar spoke, I think last week or something, that even on the Willow Lake side of town, there's extreme hazards, depending upon what your neighbors are doing. So. The firemen come out, and they really do protect. And as they give their assessment, that protects all the neighbors as well. So we have to be considerate of others, but we have to spread out this fire uh, risk and take a look at it. Water and fire go together, and it's so important that we are able. I don't know if you've noticed, if you ever have a fire in your neighborhood and you turn your hose on, 
It's like, because <laughs> the pressure is all being used, okay? It doesn't mean we don't have water, but we do need to take a look at that too. Local churches are looking at this. Other Arizona cities have looked at this. We need a sustainability report on all fronts, fire and water, temperature and other hazards. And we really need you guys to do it. And we need a plan. Um, again, any vacant land must be looked at as well as property land and 12 inches of weeds is not enough and we need to do it now. It's not a matter of Please conclude. if it's going to come, it's a matter of when. Or it's not a matter of when, it's a matter of if. Anyway, it's coming very soon. So take care. We really want you to take care of all the properties in Prescott. Thanks. Thank you. Patty Willis. Good afternoon, Mayor Good and City Council members. My name is Patty Willis, and I live with my family right next to the National Forest off of Hazley Road. I'm the pastor of Granite Peak Unitarian Universalist Congregation. And when my great-grandmother pioneered into the Bighorn Basin of northern Wyoming at the turn of the century, she depended on God and hard work in order to survive. One day when she was inside her cabin, she heard a voice calling to her that said, Clifford's in the river. And she ran. She ran to the banks of the Shoshone River and she saved her young son just in time. I have thought of this story often because it seems to me now that our earth is calling to us, that there is danger up ahead and that we must listen. The part that came to me as I was preparing to speak with you today was that by answering the call, my great mama was able to save her son Clifford's life. Across the street from my house, a path leads into the National Forest, and last year as I was preparing to go on a pilgrimage, I took that path several times a week and all around Prescott walking on those trails. And on one of those trails that, that's above Thumb Butte, um, at one point my friend's dog started racing and he went to this water hole and got all wet and running around. And then about a month later we went and there was just mud there. And then a couple of weeks after that, it was just dry. And by the time I left for my walk in June, the deer were coming out of the forest. All of them were coming into our neighborhood looking pretty parched. And I wondered when I was gone if I'd get word that there was a fire. Each year, I notice the ponderosa pines that are dying on the hillsides from the bark beetle. Last summer, Signs of the decimation of the forest seemed to call to me wherever I looked. And then in July, we had those amazing rains. And when I returned to Prescott from the Phoenix airport, the mountains around Dewey looked like the Scottish Highlands. We were saved. And now we were looking at the level of snowfall, which doesn't seem like it will be enough to keep those springs topped up through the summer. I'm grateful to the council for answering a call that the earth is in danger. In my great mama's narrative, the voice told her that her son was in danger, but not just that he was in danger. That meant she could run to where he was. The voice told her, she, he's in the river. We know that the land around us holds the dangers of water shortages and forest fires, and doing a risk assessment will help us know where we need to direct our energy and resources in order to lower those risks. What I love about my ancestor's story is that by listening to that voice, she saved her son, my uncle's life, May we, through listening and then getting to work, save this corner of the earth for the duration of our lives and for future generations. Thank you so much for your support of a climate risk assessment for Prescott and the Quad City areas. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
Carrie Stevens. City Clerk, who's next? Terry Stevens. Terry Stevens. Hi, I'm Terry Stevens, and I'm here as a concerned citizen of Prescott. I'm a third generation Prescottonian, and my grandchildren that live here are fifth generation Prescottonians. I have a father and brother who have both served on the city council in previous years, and I and my family are very blessed to live in the Prescott area. I ran the Sizzler restaurant on Miller Valley Road for about 10 years. We serviced the city of Prescott with fundraisers for the Boy Scouts of America, churches. We had um, company Christmas parties, gatherings, and much more. As you can tell, I'm not as physically like to speak in public as my brother and father. I believe the Willow Creek Inn can provide the same wonderful atmosphere and bring revenue to the city. I have full confidence in this mayor and council that a resolution can be brought to where the Willow Creek Inn can be up and functioning and serve our beautiful city and everyone's hometown. Thank you very much. Andrew Stevens. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Mayor and um, Council members. It's My name is Andy Stevens, or Andrew, whichever you prefer. Um, it's an honor uh, to be before you today. My dad, Jack Stevens, served on City Council in the 80s as well, and, and I know how much um, sacrifice of your time and effort it takes to be a part of the City Council, and I, for one, appreciate your efforts and for being here with us. Um, I am a friend of Nancy and Eric Bewley, um, who purchased the Willow Creek Inn. Um, my wife and I had the honor of being with them when they went to look at the, the Willow Creek Inn. They were having some weddings occasionally in an Airbnb that they had just above where the Willow Creek Inn is located. And, and it turned out that the weddings really were more than what they should be doing, apparently, as an Airbnb. And so this opportunity for the, the Willow Creek Inn coming available for sale was a blessing for them. Um, and so they they went down there and we got to meet with, uh, uh, we were there when they met with the realtor and the, that same day they made an offer. I, I also know there were some other people interested. There were there was a guy that drove up in a, a beautiful black Tesla, Tesla that I was a little envious of and he was, I think he went and made a cash offer just after they had signed the agreement. So I think he was going to turn it into apartments is what he wanted to do is tear the tear the building down and, and make it into apartments. I moved here in 1969. I was eight years old at the time. Um, and the Green Frog Inn was just past, m my house was just around the corner. I was at 2601 Willow Creek Road on the right hand side up on the mountain and, and the Green Frog Inn is on the left as you're going out of town. Um, I, mean, I didn't realize at the time and, until just recently that I always thought it was the Green Frog Inn but that's not the case. Um, what this building is, I was asked by Nancy and Eric to kind of do some research to see if we could get a historical, um, I guess, approval for it to be a historical building. And so I've done a lot of research on it. And my first thing I found out is this was not the Green Frog Inn. It was the Willow Creek Inn. Um, the Willow Creek Inn is a building that was actually built. I can't confirm that specifically, but it appears in 1877. I... I found the owners in the 1880 census, and uh, he was an architect, and they built the building. There's a, there's a map in um, the clerk's office of Yavapai County. It's about a fourth of what that is, and it's a, it's a, hand, it's a painted map of the city, and, and you can see the, the house that's sitting there from 18, I believe it's 1891 is when that map was made. And there's a beautiful picture of the of people sitting in front of the house um, where it was located in 1893 at the, did all this research at Charlotte Hall Museum. Anyway, I, what I found is that this building is, <laughs> has a lot of history in the city of Prescott. It's been here a long time. It, uh, 
um, was built by a, an architect who moved here in the in the late 70s, 1870s, and, and built this, and, and that then the Methodist Church sold it because they wanted to build another building, I guess, and so um, the Ewing Family Trust bought it and moved it down to where it's located now on Willow Creek Road. And it was the Willow Creek, they did that in 1962. And in 1963 in April, there's a, a paper announcement where they opened the Willow Creek Inn and there's a beautiful picture there of it. And um, anyway, it was the Willow Creek Inn originally. And then a year later, they sold it and it became the Green Frog Inn. And the Green Frog Inn was the Green Frog Cafe that was on Montezuma Street right in Whiskey Row. And that was in the 1930s. When I go through the phone books, that's the only thing I can find is around 1930. I don't have a specific date. Please conclude, Andy. Okay. My point is this. It's a beautiful building. Um, it's something I think we should try to keep, not have somebody tear it down and turn it into an apartment complex. Um, I think that my dad used to say to me, if you come to somebody with a problem, you should have a solution. And so I would just encourage each of you as a solution to this, that maybe one, of, one or two of you or whoever wants to go down and talk, not talk, just see this property, see what's going on with it. I think there either is a grandfather clause that lets them get a permit without going any further or there isn't. And I think that just needs to be resolved and figured out. And the Buleys will bring this business into a successful business for the city of Prescott that will bring lots of people to Prescott from out of town, bring lots of money <laughs> to your the downtown and, and the hotels. And I appreciate your time. I'm sorry. Thank you. Mike McLean. <clears throat> Hey, good afternoon, uh, Mayor, Council, and, and others. Um, I want to talk to you this morning. Uh, again, my name is Mike McLean about the Mullen Way infrastructure project. I know maybe Michael and I, I think that was Eric that might have been here earlier. But um, I want to maybe add some facts to this particular project. What I'm really asking uh, the Council to do is to address this project and maybe restart what has been started. Um, um, I felt I felt it was important for me to come today and represent myself because I've got a property uh, there that I'm going to build on as well as the other residents uh, that are currently there. Um, from a background standpoint, if you're not familiar with the, the Mullen Way area there, um, there's a many long term residents there. And then there's also some new construction builds that are that are starting up of, of which mine is one of those. Um, the residents don't have city water there. They are in the city of Prescott, and they've been asking for water for, for uh, a number of years and still have not been able to attain that. Um, I've been involved in the Mullen Way project for about a, a year and a half, and I know that's not very long, but I've been talking with Eric about it for about a year and a half. And there was funding identified that might help provide water to the project as part of the fiscal 21 budget. Um, I discovered most recently that that particular project um, was really put on hold for scope and timeline considerations. And so that's what I'm here about, trying to get some attention on that and reinvigorate the, the project. Um, for my particular build, and again, I'm representing myself and some other residents, for my particular build, um, I have to have sprinklers for the home that's being proposed, but we don't have access to water. So that's um, an, an issue. Um, we, again, we do reside in the city of Prescott. The area is heavily forested, so we, we need some uh, protection for the forest that is on our land. And there are no fire hydrants close to where we are. So fire risk, if it ever happens, um, will get out of control. Um, we are not asking as residents of this area for a free ride. We understand we might have to contribute. Um, my new build and maybe some of the other new builds there will help the city with um, sales tax that the city is going to receive as part of those new builds. So what I'm really asking for respectively is asking for someone to look back into this project, reinvigorate it. Um, for myself again, I'm a little selfish, I admit that. I'm about to go back to the city for, for uh, resubmission um, of the building permit. 
And so I'm getting close, and so I need to get started, and then I know a lot of the residents that have been there for a long period of time have been looking for the water and the protection that I have mentioned. So again, thank you for your time. Um, I'm hoping we can work together and uh, further work on the project. Thank you. Thank you. Yvonne Dorman. Mayor and Council, my name is Yvonne Dorman. Uh, I'm the person who offered the maps that I think you have in front of you. I just want to maybe explain a little bit why our project on Mullen has been changed so many times. On the map that you see is the map that the city told me to use, the parameters they said to use to be annexed into the city if we were to be annexed. Um, the lovely Jane Bristol first helped me, then Tom Geis, and this has been to many city councils, and generally what a council says, well, I wasn't here then, but we'll take a look at it, and this has been going on for about 25 years. Um, in, this was in 19, 1997. Uh, Dwayne Famous is the one who did this plat in, I don't know, maybe 2000, 2002. Anyway, the Indian fire did come roaring through in 2002. There was a lot of bark beetle in the area. I mean, I even learned how to chainsaw myself because you couldn't find anybody to help you. So we did it ourselves. Um, I did not know that the city had decided to annex a whole bunch of other properties outside of this L-shaped area that you see. Um, the price initially to hook up to water and sewer was going to be $2,600, $2,800. And then after these other properties, then, the, then it went to $20,000. And then after these other properties were added, because I guess topography, I'm not sure, um, the price went $32,000 and then $67,000, which, of course, we could not afford. Um, We've, so we bowed out. A lot of the people decided not to be annexed. Apparently, I don't know how all that worked. But beyond Bonner Lane, our county, there is county residents, and then there's a tiny area in there that is also part of the city. So it just it's, it seems to be a problem to try to get fire hydrants in there. Um, it's a scary, scary thing to think about the bark beetle coming again, the trees getting thinner, the deer. We have lots of wildlife in our area, um, all of it, good and bad. But we live with them, and they live with us, and it works out fine. Um, we even tried to de-annex. We said, well, okay, we, you know, we'll try something else. And we were told that's against the law. You can't de-annex once you've been annexed. So we've been in this situation since since I moved here anyway in the 90s. So um, I'm hoping you all would listen to the fire department, police department. You know, when they say they have needs, I mean, they're, they're nice people. They're good people. They're excellent people. I mean, they put out that Indian fire so beautifully. I mean, they, they got it before it got to us. A mandatory evacuation is a scary thing. You do not forget when the sheriff's posse person comes through and yells, get the hell out of here now. You know, you see a 130 over your head, a slurry bomber, whatever that airplane was, and you can see actually see the pilot. It's... Um, I hope the city, before um, it annexes more property, I hope the city will take care of its own first. Thank you. Thank you for your time again. Thank you. I do have um, another green card from Edward Bow, but it looks like you want to speak on the Granite Creek project, which is agendized. So I'm going to set your card aside until we get to that item. Okay. That's all, Mayor. Thank you. That uh, concludes our open call to the public. 
So at this point, we will move uh, to the uh, consent agenda. Um, does anyone have any of the items that they want to pull from consent? Uh, hearing none, I'll uh, entertain a motion. I move to approve consent agenda items A, 9A through 9E. Second. I have a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? Please vote. Passes 6-0. All right, we will move on to the next area, which is our uh, regular agenda. Approval of FNP 20-009, a final plat for Astoria Phase 2A, consisting of 84 dwelling units in a business general zoning district, location APN 105-04-002T, property owner Mike Fan, applicant Kevin Horton, Lion Engineering and Surveying. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman, members of the board, Commission Council. Sorry, uh, Tammy DeWitt, Community Planner, City of Prescott. So this is a final plat to create 84 single-family residential lots over 8.48 acres. Um, that is a planned area development. They are required to have 25% open space. Um, they are proposing 76.34% open space over the whole prop property. So the original preliminary plat was approved in 1998 as part of the uh, water rush, the plat rush, um, approving the number of lots per phase. Um, and I have a copy of that to show you. Um, it's always fun going back to these older projects and diving into them and trying to decipher them. So in a concept plan, um, was approved in 2006 to define the units and the layout of the units. So the preliminary plat just defined how many units were going to be in certain areas. Then they came forward with the, pl the concept plan to actually define the layout of the units. And then a water service agreement 21-016 was approved by the city council at their at your tw October 26, 2021 meeting. So for this property, it is Prescott Lakes. Um, it's zoned business general commercial, similar to um, the other some of the other adjacent residential developments. This is all a business general zoned area. This is a vacant area, and then we have the uh, first phase here of Astoria, and you have the connection here that will uh, give another alternate access into this development, and then we'll have other access come up here to Smoke Tree. So this is the preliminary plat that was approved. <laughs> so instead of showing the layout, it showed the number of units that would overall be approved for the water allocation, for the groundwater allocation. So right here we have uh, Blooming Hills right here. This is Prescott Lakes. Then we have the smoke tree coming in here. So this area here, we have 150 units here. They had 70 units here, 135 units in this area. Then we had 275 units here, and then we had areas designated for commercial, and then another 80 units down here. So this was approved, this area, for a total of 710 residential units, um, of which only 118 were platted as part of Falcon Point in this area here. So that leaves us um, oops, 592 residential units left, residential lots or units left for this area. Which I'm not seeing them meeting all that because once we have the 118 and what's proposed for the uh, the other area, then it leaves the rest of it for about 500 lots going in the rest of the area. So this is the 2006 um, Prescott Lakes approved concept plan. It, it is kind of small here. So how this was approved? They are residential lots, but they aren't single family. Um, these were attached townhome units up here. All these smaller ones are attached townhomes. And then down here, we had 10 lots that were approved for fourplexes. So it was all kind of multifamily, single family, but platted to uh, be able to sold off and individually owned. So when we looked at this and we look at what was presented now, we had to look and make sure it was in substantial conformance to the resolution passed by council. Um, it has the same street layout. It has the same connection point to the Astoria. It has the same lot layout. 
Um, the lots are a little different because now they're coming forward with single family residential lots, detached houses, instead of them having a common wall as townhomes. So that's the only really change, and they've gone from 126 down to 80, 84. So this is the existing Astoria, and then this is what's being proposed here now. So it has the same uh, road configuration. We have the same connection between the lots. And then they're going to have um, a new connection up here to Smoke Tree. And so that concludes my presentation. I'm free to answer any questions you may have. And the applicant is also here to answer any questions. Not working. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. It's not working. <laughs> this is turned on. <laughs> I don't think it is, but. That's yeah, not working. Yeah. Short, short it out. Uh, just a quick councilman uh, Moore. Thank please. you, Mayor. Just a quick question, Tammy. Sure. I seem to recall just driving that road quite a bit. There's quite a bit of slope and elevation elevation change between Astoria and the mm -hmm. area that's proposing. How how that's going to be handled as far as the grade of the road and the houses there along Smoke Tree? Because there's quite a drop in elevation there. Yes, it's all being engineered, and we've got the engineering plans in right now to make it all work. It is going to be a lower elevation than Astoria, so it won't block any of the existing homes up there. We're anticipating them to be single story, similar to what we see at Astoria at this time. Um, <clears throat> please allow me to make a few comments. Um, this uh, <clears throat> phase has been uh, discussed for several years by the uh, HOA. And um, the main point is that they feel that this is a substantial change from the master plan and that this little residential road called Kenmore was never intended to be the main access to this phase. Um, what's now known as Astoria is a residential gated community and yet this new phase is planning on having over 80 homes now connected by one small little residential road that's going down a big hill side of the mountain and it will apparently be the only access and i went on the city website and printed out a copy of the master plan that's on our own website from 2005 and it shows smoke tree being extended and gated. And there's a little roundabout that goes to what used to be called Saddleback. And, and then there's also another um, phase behind the, the green, um, the golf green, that is also supposed to be accessed off of Saddleback. And it looks like it might be landlocked if we don't... Um, have any access on this other side. So I'm, I'm very concerned about uh, public safety, fire access. Apparently the owner is gonna put in a, like some sort of a temporary construction road for the phase to be built. But my question is why doesn't he just go ahead and build a road so that these people won't be cutting through this one residential neighborhood? So to answer your question, um, so they are going to build a temporary road to connect up to Smoke Tree that will be used as a primary access um, until they get a time to build where the roundabout is. So this uh, concept plan showed that connector road to Smoke Tree and coming up, that is still planned. Right now they're going to build a temporary road until they get to building that main road, but the, the temporary road will be the main access to this development. Do we have anything in writing about the plans for smoke tree do we have a anything concrete other than just a kind of a verbal this might happen and i'll defer that for the applicant i want future future plans for that for their phases down the road well councilman shishka thank you mayor you know, when I went over this with you guys over at Community Development, I'm sitting there going, boy, this is great. Originally on the concept map, there was a, like 100 and, did you say 118? Um, there was there was like 100. Um, 
There's 126 for the concept plan. 126 for the concept, and, and he wants to build how many? 84. 84. 84. <laughs> sounds like a real deal for me. I mean, you know, it, it sounds like he's not doing nearly what he could have done in that area, and he's given us a lot of open space. I, you know, I'm not sure what the problem is. And in per the approved preliminary plat for this area, you know, with 710 units overall for this area, right now we have 118 already platted. Now we have another 84. I mean, that leaves about 500 lots left for that, the rest of the area, potentially. But um, in, in reality, will that happen? But you never know. It is still in business. John Lilly could do multifamily developments out there. Um, similar to what they had for the concept plan. The concept plan was uh, townhomes attached and uh, fourplexes. So there would have been 40 uh, fourplex units there, and the rest were all um, townhomes connected by a common wall. So now they're going to be detached single-family residences, less Isn't impact. Isn't that more in, in, in tune with the neighborhood that's above them? Correct. It's the same product as we see in Astoria that's already been developed. Councilman Moore. Um, I agree with many of the points that Steve's made, but I also share Kathy's concern as far as access to that property. I'm wondering why they're building a temporary road and not, why not just go ahead and build that road as a, temp a permanent road in conjunction with doing this phase of the project. Um, it makes sense to connect it directly to Smoke Tree where there'd be a four, four way intersection right there. So I'm just curious if that could be addressed. Councilman Moore, um, George Worley, I'm the planning manager here. Um, a little information you'll probably get more from the applicant when they come up to speak. Um, that road alignment more or less has to be built in the way that it's shown there because of topography. So the extension of Smoke Tree doesn't have a lot of flexibility and movement. Unfortunately, it crosses four pieces of property and there are four property owners involved in order to be able to get a design constraint. So it's not, uh, it's not under one ownership and that's been the delay in the problem. And I think Mr. Fan, uh, when he comes up to speak about this, we'll be able to give you more information about his negotiations with those other property owners. We have Councilman Tenney. S similar comment and question. I'm, I'm pleased to see that the density has gone down from the initial uh, plan for things. So that, that's a positive, and I'm just interested in more information about ingress and egress, and it sounds like we'll have our applicant talk about that. So I'm looking forward to that. Me too. <clears throat> well, I have uh, similar concerns. I think Canmore Drive, the access there is adequate as far as a road width. So I think it's what, uh, two 20 foot wide lanes. So it's a little bit narrow, but uh, not, not um, significantly. So the real concern is that temporary uh, egress uh, road. And I imagine that's probably not gonna be uh, uh, fully um, developed as, a, as an actual road. Will it eventually connect with a smoke tree as a, as a full road? It will, and eventually it will be designed and constructed similar to what's shown on the, on the plan above. Um, Mr. Fan has acknowledged that that's the ultimate goal of, of getting the road constructed to that standard, but we don't want to wait on it. And he does have a connection that is possible to both smoke tree uh, as a temporary connection and the permanently designed connection between the two neighborhoods. This initial neighborhood was designed to have that attached to it with 126 units, um, all accessing either way through the neighborhood. So it wasn't intended to be a one-way access to Smoke Tree. You could get to Prescott Lakes Parkway in either direction. It was originally planned as a single neighborhood under a single developer. Ultimately, this piece was sold off, and, and now we have a new developer for this piece. So the concept of connecting the two neighborhoods together stays the same. The future construction of the extension of Smoke Tree is dependent upon coordination between the city in approving the design and four separate property owners and actually constructing it. So the temporary design that Mr. Fan has proposed stays on his property and doesn't cross those other properties. And unfortunately, that's um, 
that, that's the best he can do without others participating in the program, and that's what we're we're waiting on. So will this temporary uh, egress road here that connects with the future alignment of Smoke Tree, does he, is there a um, right of way or um, easement for uh, being able to have vehicles on that um, uh, Smoke Tree extension? It's on the plug. The extension of Smoke Tree actually jogs in just slightly off of the existing roadway and then it, would be, it becomes private property. So the temporary road connection would be made to that small extension of the public right of way um, at that point. So yes, there is a place designed for that future extension in Prescott Lakes Parkway. And looking at this plat map, it looks like there's uh, going to be a future cul-de-sac road with probably another, I don't know, 30, 35 homes on that. Uh, future, can you call up the plat, please? Sorry. I don't have the plat. That's all I have with the plat. So you mean up in, in here? Yeah, this one here. So you got this, looks like a cul-de-sac. Of that's that's the temporary road. The temporary road. That's the temporary road. Yeah, it comes off of. Yeah, it comes off of the the um, so right hand the side of the page. Yellow is the yeah. temporary. Yes. But what about this um, alignment here for another that's another? Road. So we have two temporary roads. No, that one's actually a, a future cul-de-sac. That's correct. Right. Yes. Not part of this phase right. of development. So if that cul-de-sac is uh, developed, you'll have another thirty. Five homes, probably something 20, like that. In there. Twenty some odd, I think, yeah. was the discussion. There are 16. 16. 16. 16. Okay. Right here, 16. So, can I? I'll see that in raise you five. <laughs> Isn't he approved for a hundred lots? <laughs> yes. Um, do you, yeah, there's two That'll phase. There's two phases of this. So the first phase is the two the two A that we're seeing today. Then there'll be another phase to come in for the additional sixteen lots. And and that the additional twenty houses to bring it up to a hundred won't be built until smoke tree is straightened out. It won't be and brought forward. Kevin Horton, Line Engineering. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, the, you, that's correct. There's 16 additional units that come off of that cul-de-sac shown on the plat. So to get the sewer, the project to sewer, that, uh, that cul-de-sac, there's actually an easement there shown on the plat as a part of that additional phase, future phase 2B, a little bit different than usually done, but we had to provide public utility easement there because there are utilities that go down that um, future cul-de-sac to be able to get the project to sewer. So the, the problem, as George um, stated pretty well, is the at the north end of this, only the first 150 feet or so of that smoke tree extension is under control and ownership of the applicant. So as George said, um, when the project was originally planned, this was intended to be developed by a single owner. The whole thing, both this, this subdivision and the subdivision to the um, northeast of this, that is no longer under control um, of them. And through the design process, we tried to work with the owner and we tried to work with that other property owner to get a collaborative effort to build smoke tree extension as staff wanted, but the other owner was not ready and wanted nothing to do with that at the time. So we did the best we could and we tried to uh, comply with what staff wanted. We provided an emergency ingress egress, which is shown on the plat that winds down the hill and it's pretty, pretty constrained with the topography there. So we did what we could to have the grades acceptable to the fire department so their apparatus could get in and out of that thing safely and residents could in an emergency situation. So that easement is shown on the plat on the north end of that little T intersection that heads to the west to connect to the existing 80-foot smoke, smoke tree easement. So um, in that sheet, that's on sheet three of five of the final plat that it shows there. Yeah, that's so, what I'm looking at. So there will be a all weather access out of the north end of this thing in the um, interim condition phase 2A when the additional 16 lots of phase 2B are platted in the future. Um, that cannot happen until the smoke tree extension is constructed. Mm. And I'll take the collaborative effort of all those property owners to the north. Mm. <clears throat> I'd like to hear from the uh, fire department to make sure that uh, this is going to be acceptable as uh, emergency uh, egress access 
for um, <clears throat> for fire vehicles. And just just to add before I, I leave the podium, um, the the plans have been vetted and fully approved by the Public Works Department. So um, they have looked at this, but I'll let the fire department comment. Mayor, members of the council, uh, to move a project forward, that secondary access, whether it's permanent or an emergency, has to meet the weight and grade limits for our fire apparatus, which is 75,000 pounds, all weather. Um, in order to move that process forward, they have to commit to building that. It doesn't have to be a, a hard surface road. It could be AB, actually. And that's not uncommon. All right, very good. Any other uh, comments or concerns? So just to clarify, Chief, the, the fire department has, has looked at these plans and said, yep, we can get in and out safely and we can get people in and out safely in case of an emergency. Mayor, um, Councilman Tenney, I believe that is correct. I have not seen them myself. Okay. Um, but to get to this level, they had to sign off. Our right. plans reviewers had to sign so off. On I'm it. not going to second guess that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, very good. Um, Mayor, just... If I may, one final comment. We have heard from a proposed owner of the property to the northeast that was uh, looking at that property for development as single family. Um, the fact that someone else is looking at that property now may be enough to trigger that road construction, the extension of Smoke Tree, that would be a willing buyer who has to have the road to get to his property. So you have someone who may be a, a partner. Fair enough, I'll uh, entertain a motion on this. Uh, Mayor, you have public item. comment before you take a motion. Oh, okay. Robert Sisley. Good afternoon. My name is Bob Sisley. I'm the president of the Prescott Lakes Community Association Board of Directors. You may have seen me here before, and you'll probably see me here next month again. So I'd like to give a little bit of clarification on these two neighborhoods. Um, you've seen this, the ever popular master plan map, right. but there's several of them. And the one that's in the development agreement doesn't differentiate between Astoria, Saddleback, Predator Ridge, whatever. There are two color maps and they're both dated the same thing. One of them is called Falcon Point and both of those properties are marked as Falcon Point, which is now known as Astoria. But the other one shows Falcon Point and Saddleback. Then there's one to the north, which is called Predator Ridge. And those all three kind of tie together. So we have a real concern with the fact that um, there's an assumption that these two neighborhoods were meant to be one neighborhood. Yes, they are joined together by Canmore, but the master plan clearly shows that the main ingress and egress was intended to be smoke tree. And it's my understanding too, because I've talked to Mr. Fan yesterday, I think it was, and he clarified this to me. He had a sit down uh, meeting with the Astoria residents and explained this whole thing. So the property that, as was explained, he can't build that smoke tree because it goes on other people's property. Um, there has been, this, this slightly deviates from the preliminary plan. It has not been presented to the HOA for final approval, so I can't speak on behalf of the board of directors, but I'm gonna take, I'm gonna make an assumption that I agree with Councilman Siska that this is going from 126 down to 100. Now, it's not 84, it's 100 because he got 100 water rights. In my understanding, he wants to do 84, and then when the road gets connected, he can do the other ones to bring them up to 100. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that I feel the board will be very supportive of this. They're going to give them more lots, I'm, I'm sorry, more space, more common area. They're not going to be as, as tight. Astoria is not single family. There are several two-story homes that are in there. I don't know what Mr. Fan is going to do, if he's going to lop off the top of the hill or not. The big concern of the Astoria residents, and really why I'm here, is this connecting road between these two developments, Canmore Lane, was not, never intended to be the main and the only point of ingress and egress. Mr. Fan has said that he's going to do this construction road, and that's where all the construction traffic is going to go, the uh, extension of smoke tree, which is great. But he's also said that if he, when he starts developing, whoever he's going to get to build homes, that the finished homes, the residents, would exit through Astoria. So I don't know what's going to come first, the chicken or the egg, but I don't think the residents in Astoria want to have 84 homes 
exiting through their neighborhood. If you were to look at the map again and you look at the, at the, the proposal, the north end, everybody living on the north end is going to go out smoke tree. The, but I don't know what's going to happen at Smoke Tree and Prescott Lakes Parkway. There's going to have to be some type of traffic control. There's no right-hand turn lanes, north and south. It's going to be it's going to be problematic. Will they cut through? Would they cut through Astoria even if Smoke Tree was there? Possibly because there's a light there. But I have a we the residents have a real concern about all these vehicles using a road that was not intended to meet the only entrance into that until this whole thing is done. Now, I don't know if Mr. Fan is looking at starting to develop now. He told me, and I don't want to speak on behalf of him or, or, or the, the applicant, he's not planning on moving this forward right now. I'm not really too sure why they're getting final platting. He explained to me he did not have a home builder, so I'm not really sure, but the residents are genuinely concerned. So um, again, I think the board of the board of directors would be uh, supportive of his 100 homes that he's planning on there. But right now, everything going through Canmore into Astoria, I, I, it's just, it's concerning. So thank you very much. Any questions? Thanks. Councilman Moore. I, I do have a question. I, I'm just wondering why, if we're building a temporary road for construction, why, why we can't make that temporary road a permanent road for that? phase of the development so that the homeowners who live there can continue to use that road to get in and out of that development until smoke tree extension is completed. I, I, I really feel like the sticking point is access in this whole issue. It's not the development. The development's fine. I think we're all in agreement that we're happy with fewer homes, but why can't that temporary road be used as a, a permanent road? Well, I guess that's a question for the developer. Kevin Horton, Line Engineering. Mr. Mayor, members of the council. The uh, city traffic engineer has uh, vetted this and we've coordinated with them on the extra load, traffic load through the existing Astoria. And the master plan, the plans in the past have all showed that Canmore extension being there. Um, and I agree there was a secondary access there, but we've looked at this and the existing signalized intersection, the existing roads, the existing road network through Astoria has plenty of capacity for the additional traffic, very limited traffic based on that residential use coming in and out of there. And that, that has been looked at through this process so um, and approved by the Public Works Department. So it is an interim condition until that future phase 2B gets constructed and the smoke tree extension gets constructed, but the feasibility of getting that connection down there at this point without the collaborative effort of those other property owners doesn't work. Um, Mayor yes. Pro Tem. Thank you. Um, I'm I'm still wondering, I didn't answer like the question. Mr. Moore. I didn't answer the question. Yeah, I'm still wondering why, Mr. Moore, if if you can build a construction road that's going to handle backhoes and graders and cement trucks and everything, why you can't pave it and turn it into an access road, and it'll be a temporary. <laughs> permanent access road until smoke tree can get figured out because I am not a fan of daisy chaining one subdivision after another uh, onto one traffic light through a residential neighborhood. Because this will decrease people's properties values. This isn't what uh, the original neighborhood was sold. Uh, good, good question, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. The the logistics of doing that at this point um, don't do not make sense from a design standpoint because what what would happen? We've worked with um, staff on this, looking into this. If we connected a road down there that would be an interim road, um, there was there would be design considerations at that smoke tree intersection. They would have to be taken care of and kind of uh, piecemealed. It would be a piecemeal situation now versus the complete design later. We don't know at this time and the time we were designing this, we didn't know what was going to be proposed at that upcoming, as George mentioned, there's a subdivision kind of in the works right now in that property that was not in the works when we planned this. We're still not sure how many units that's going to yield. The use and proposed use that comes from that, and that's, that's pending, that's still unknown, 
will dictate what happens down there at that smoke tree intersection for the ultimate build out condition. You're exactly right. There may need to be a right turn lane going into that. There w might be there might be a left turn lane and signalized situation that may result in that depending on their use. If they if they propose 50 units, that's a lot different than them proposing 500 units. So to try to design something now would be um, it, it, it's just it's just not warranted from a traffic standpoint. We looked at this through Public Works and those additional 84 units going through Canmore and going through existing Astoria, especially with the timing, the time that it takes to build this, the time that it takes build the infrastructure and then build the homes were years down the road when um, we would know a lot more about construction that. traffic can go in and out absolutely not construction um, traffic and all the talking about we'll be using the same road the temporary construction road it'll be okay for traffic from construction but cars it'll be too unsafe for cars if it was paved to use for like a couple of years, maybe two or three years till smoke tree gets figured out? Excellent question. We've uh, talked with Public Works about this and there will be traffic control. I think the, the applicant wants to speak, but there will be traffic control in place during construction that's interim flaggers and possibly temp, uh, temporary signal, I'm not sure, but that's a construction aspect and not a permanent aspect, but I'll let the applicant speak. Maybe I can help Mike Fan Fan uh, Astoria too today. <laughs> um, so the uh, Eric, the answer to that really is that road is going to be fine for emergency. It'll be built to handle backhoes and dump trucks and fire trucks, uh, and and a and a police car can get in there, but to open it up to the public um, and have the public use that road. Um, I think at that point is where we run into a real liability issue. It's not built to city standards. Um, we could pave it, but it would not be built to city standards at that point. So I think from um, just from a liability standpoint, um, it's where a problem. Uh, if we were to build it to city standards, um, I don't think the project goes forward at this point. Um, it's, it's just not feasible to do it. Um, and then like Kevin said, smoke tree, um, I'd love to build smoke tree right now. I'd, I I would wa I want to build smoke tree right now. Um, I can't. It's not on my property, and the and the property owner that is on there doesn't doesn't want to participate. Doesn't want it to move forward at this time. There is another buyer there. Um, by the time we build homes, by the time somebody builds homes, maybe smoke tree will be under construction. I don't know. I don't I don't control that. So um, I'm speculating there. Um, I do know Canmore was always the connection point from the very, very first plan that uh, Bill Brownlee and Jeff Davis brought forward for Prescott Lakes. Canmore was there. The traffic was going to go through that always, always. And Ian Mattingly, the city engineer, said the uh, uh, traffic signal that has a uh, uh, design capacity to handle everything in Astoria and everything I am proposing also. That's from your public works department. Councilman Moore. I, I do have a question about that signal because it's a gated community and there's not a lot of linear distance between the gate and the light. So like if there's traffic coming out and there's backing up because there's a gate there, because that's a long light because there's more traffic going north south than there is east west at that light. Is that a, that, I mean, I think that needs to be addressed. Th those gates have loop detectors on them so they won't close if there's a car in, in the way. So those, those, there is, uh, I'm doing gates right now at Granite Hills Estate. So there's seven different loops associated with those gates to make sure a gate doesn't close on somebody. So if traffic backs up mm -hmm. into the gate, the gates can't close. Okay. I have, I have a question, Mike. Um, originally, um, <clears throat> Saddleback, it used to be called, was going to be behind a gate and have private roads. Are you going to have private roads? Are these going to be publicly taxpayer maintained residential roads these, these will be gated roads also just like it's it's always always gated from the north astoria one and astoria two from from day one was always going to be gated those are going to be private roads they're built to city standards but they're private roads and they'll be maintained by the uh, hoa that's correct thank you thank you i think that uh, concludes our discussions we have another public comment mayor okay Tom Rusing. 
Uh, Mayor and Council. Well, I, I didn't anticipate uh, talking on this, and this is actually the first time I've seen it. Uh, but just as somebody who's been involved in the issues of growth and traffic and uh, concerned by the public, uh, I can't imagine approving a uh, development that has limited access with no guarantee of adequate ingress and egress. It just seems like the current small road that goes to another development is not adequate. And to approve a development with some possible time in the future where they may be able to put it in seems a little dicey to me. And it would certainly make me concerned if I lived in those areas. And it just seems like the kind of thing, one, that may have been better at a study session to really figure out all of the details of it. Uh, but it just on the surface, and I, I, like I said, I just saw this at this meeting, but it's something that certainly got my antennas up and concerned of moving ahead where there's uncertainty about adequate ingress and egress. Thank you. Can I just ask a yeah, clarifying question? Our, our folks in the city have determined that there is adequate ingress and egress for traffic. Yes, I thought I heard that earlier. Okay, right. super. And then my other question is, we're not being asked about that today, in fact. I mean, it's a concern of mine for sure, but we're being asked if this final plat conforms with the original plat, yes? That's yes. what we're about to vote on. So the legal standard is, is it, does it substantially conform with the preliminary plat? That's kind of the only question you've got to assess. So you can take a look at that resolution Super. and kind of go line by line and then make a determination. Staff has already, in their minds, determined that it is substantially conforming. Uh, but ultimately, it's kind of a back question. We're, we're not being asked about traffic ingress and egress. I mean, it's, we've, we've received assurances on that, but that's not what we're about to vote on. Okay. And with that um, emergency egress, uh, these homes do not have to be sprinklered. Is that correct? There's, there's, there, they'll be put installing um, uh, sprinkler, I mean, sorry, fire hydrants throughout the development, so no other sprinklers are not required. Right. So if there's only one ingress, egress, they have to be sprinklered. Mm -hmm. But with this uh, emergency uh, exit, that relieves them of that requirement? My understanding, yes. We haven't got that far in the review process at this time till they start building houses to see where they are. Well, I agree. It's um, it's a little bit difficult to approve it when the extension of smoke tree is up in the air, and we don't know when it's going to be developed. So in the meantime, the development of this uh, area with the residents in it um, we're going to have a little bit of difficulty, but I think uh, we were being asked to make a decision on whether this is a substantial conformance. Right. So I think at that point, uh, if we focus on that kind of narrow part of the decision, then uh, we can move forward. So I'll entertain a motion. Mayor, I move to approve FNP 20-009. Second. A motion is second. Any further discussion? Please vote. Passes 6-1. All right, moving on to the next item on the agenda, 10B. Approval of PLN 21-003, a preliminary plot for Forest Highlands Townhome Subdivision, a 22 lot townhome subdivision, location APN 109. Dash one two dash zero three eight a one point two two five acre parcel on the southwest corner of White's Bar Road and Forest Highlands. Site zoning business general, property owner Prescott Highlands LLC. Thank you, Mayor Council, Tammy DeWitt, community planner. The subject property is located here we have White Spar Road, we have Copper Basin here, and Forest Highlands. This is um it has a, currently a restaurant on the property, it will be demoed. And it is the um, zone business general, another commercial development. Most of the development around here is residential uses. Here's the imagery of the property with the current restaurant that will be demoed down. Um, Forest Highlands Road here is a private road. And then we have White Spar here, which is a city road. And this is the back area, which is currently vacant. So the summary, this is a 22 lot townhome subdivision on 1.225 acres, zone business general. 
Um, the homes will be two-story with two-car garages. Uh, proposed amenities are a spool, which is a spa slash pool into one unit, um, a barbecue area, and a ramada. Here's the plat in question. Um, we have White Spar Road here, and that's the main access. And then we have emergency access here onto Forest Highlands here. Um, they could not get um, approvals from the HOA to be able to do it, so that they have emergency access there only. Um, it meets all our code requirements. It's been reviewed by Public Works, and they've uh, these are all be platted individual lots to be sold. They each have their own individual um, sewer and water connections. So this is what's being proposed for the property. Um, double car garage on the bottom, residential on top. Some of them do have bedrooms or something in the back on the lower level, but most of them need livable areas up on top. There are some issues for consideration when you look for preliminary plats. These have all been reviewed and they were in your st the staff report and it shows that this project is in conformance with our preliminary plat requirements. This was in front of our Planning and Zoning Commission who recommend, unanimously recommended approval of the preliminary plat as presented at their December 9th, 2021 meeting. Um, the Water Issues Subcommittee re reviewed this application on January 11th, 2022 and recommended approval of the, for the proposed 22 single family residences. That concludes my presentation. I'm free to answer any questions that you may have. <clears throat> What was the vote from P and Z? Unanimous. Unanimous. Okay. Can you tell me what the uh, control mechanism would be for that uh, egress onto Forest Highlands? It'd be gated. Just gated, and um, is it going to be padlocked or something? Or they'll have to have um, requirements. They have to meet the requirements for fire. So when they come up, that they'll open. So usually it's a Lomar or system or right. that. So the. Uh, the light will trigger it. vehicles will be able to make yes. that. Yes, uh, and police. Open. All right, uh, Councilman Montoya. Uh, Tammy, were there any concerns that uh, any of the commissioners uh, expressed at PNZ that might be useful for us to know about? I mean, I approved unanimously, but I'm, I guess I'm just asking, did they ask any questions about things that might be useful for us to know? I don't, I don't recall any really basic discussion on them. I believe the only question was concerning the emergency egress on the Forest Highlands and why it was emergency only and not a full. That access. was my recollection. So I, think I just we, we commented on yeah, that. That, yeah. that was my recollection. I just want to make sure I was right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I didn't see a light there. But, uh, <laughs> Councilman Shishka. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I live in Forest Highlands, and what is currently there, which is. Um, has been there since the 40s, I believe, uh, the restaurant. And uh, I'll tell you what, it would be a great, great improvement to the entrance of Forest Islands to have this there rather than what's there right now. <laughs> All right, any uh, further questions? Any comments from the public? No, Mayor. No, I just say it's it's a infill project, mm -hmm. and I support the infill projects. Very good. Then I'll entertain a motion. Mayor, I um, move to approve FNP two zero dash zero zero nine. Wrong motion. Uh, wrong motion. Oh, I'm sorry. I retract that. <laughs> Mayor, I move to approve PLN twenty one dash zero zero three. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Please vote. Pass the seven zero. All right, item 10D. Uh, before we move on to that, um, Tyler, did you wanna? Just regarding the last item on the agenda, item H, the presentation on the Granite Creek area plan. Leslie Dornfeld, our consultant, had to get off the call. I think she has childcare tonight that she had to go take care of. And so we hope to table this uh, for a future meeting. We didn't have any more than a general update for you tonight. And I know she's happy to meet with individual council members and we can work on that with her going forward. We'll bring it back at a future council meeting, but just wanted to make you aware. 
Very good. Okay, thank you. You also did a pretty thorough presentation of planning and zoning, which I think are and, recorded. And, so if anyone wants to go back and watch those. And historic preservation as well, and also a study session before this council was seated. Yeah, and she's going to go back to historic preservation and the planning commission and then come back to you. So you'll thoroughly vet this publicly, I think. At some point. Okay. Right, at this point, we'll go to 10D. Uh, we're actually on 10C, which is approval or denial of water service application number WSA 21-006, submitted by Jerry Palmer Architects, LTD, on behalf of property owner Prescott Highlands, LLC, location APN 109-12-038. Appreciate that. Uh, let's do 10C. <laughs> <laughs> That's some serious leadership there. And I'll read the wrong motion. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Long day. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Gwen Rowich, Public Works Deputy Director. This one should be fairly straightforward. This request is associated with the previous agenda item, right. which is the preliminary plat for Forest Highland Subdivision. It's a 22 unit townhome subdivision. It will be. Um, Replacing the site has previously been used for a restaurant, which was built in 1946. Councilman Shishka, so you were very close on the year. The uh, existing restaurant water use was estimated at 0.42 acre feet per year. We looked that up, looked that up for you. Each townhome will have its separate water meter. Um, the estimated potable demand is 3.74 acre feet a year for the homes. The spool. Um, is estimated at 0 0.02 acre feet and the landscaping at 0 0.32 for a total estimated water use of 4.08 acre feet. This did go before planning commission in December and the water issues subcommittee on January 11th voted unanimously to approve this project. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Councilman Montoya. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Gwen. I, uh, I want to echo uh, Mayor Pro Tem Rusing's sentiments that I think this is a good project uh, for infill, and uh, certainly it sounds like it'll benefit Councilman Sushka's drive home, so that's nice. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I just want to express, given the robust conversation we've had during study session today regarding budgets for, you know, acre feet of water and how we're, the draft policy is... Uh, coming along for a new water policy. I do have some reservations about water applications coming forward. I know that, you know, if someone submits an application, we have to take it, and I, I understand that. But I guess I just have some reservations about this. You know, in this specific case, the, the acre feet of water that they're seeking is, is not that interesting for a budget, but I just want to express that concern. Okay. Councilman Tenney. Quickly, one more time for me, current water usage or allocation to the restaurant versus what's being proposed total? So uh, historically, the restaurant is at 0.42 acre okay. feet, okay. and the proposed use is 4.08. 4 .08. Okay, thank you. So at 4.1, um, with a allocation expectation of 0.17, would probably be around 24 units anyway. So this is 22. Um, this is even less than we would normally consider for a development of this size. All right, any other questions or concerns? Any comments from the public? No, Mayor. All right, I'll entertain a motion now on 10C. Mayor, I move to approve WSA 21-006. Second. Second. Please vote. Passes 7-0. What do you think we go to 10D now? <laughs> Sounds <laughs> good. Everybody okay with that? <laughs> do we have to? Thank you. Approval of city contract number 2022-144 for the unbudgeted purchase of one 2022 Peterbilt commercial front load refuse vehicle from Allstate Peterbilt using source well contract number 060920-PMC pricing. Good evening. We'll say now, Mayor, Council, Craig Dosseth, Public Works Director for 32 more days. <laughs> Who's counting? Counting? Ah. Wow. So let's talk about Woody garbage. won an award. <laughs> oh wait, you got that. So, so, so let's talk a little garbage. So this item is to consider um, 
the purchase of an unbudgeted front load garbage truck that, that has failed us. So the Solid Waste Division working in conjunction with Fleet Services Division is requesting uh, the authorization of the purchase of one new commercial front load collection truck. So the front load collection vehicles on a weekly basis um, help us manage 1,400 commercial accounts, um, ser servicing our customers uh, six days a week. So these trucks um, take regular maintenance to ensure reliability and maximally useful life. Um, as vehicles age, key components suffer failures, require repairs and or replacement, as is the case with this unit, which is a 2008 truck. Uh, normal life expectancy for the use that we put them to um, for a replacement plan is more in the realm of eight years. And we're at 14. So this truck, the motor has completely failed. And as we evaluated the motor, as well as uh, transmission uh, work that would need to be done with it, uh, came up with that we're looking at $60,000 um, to put into it to bring it back on the street. And at that, you know, then we look at, do we use it two years with everything else, as tired as it is on the rest of the unit? and put that kind of, of money into it. So collectively, we've identified that that's not fiscally responsible to do that with this piece of equipment. So that's where we're requesting uh, the unbudgeted um, replacement of it. Uh, finance has identified that we do have funding to be able to cover it, but it was not considered in the FY22 budget. The old unit will be uh, submitted um, to the auction uh, along with other assets that are being disposed of from the city fleet in there. And um, I had uh, some questions from Councilman Montoya in regards to equipment. What are we doing in order to keep something like this from happening? And that, that was an excellent question and excellent timing because we've also been working on another proposal to get pricing for three trucks that are supposed to be in FY23 for replacement. What Fleet Services is receiving for information from our suppliers currently is 465 days to get our garbage trucks. Mm -hmm. So if we wait till July 1st to approve those, you'll never see them in FY23. You'll get them sometime in 24. So there would be no expenditure in 23, as well as then we have the potential that we're stretching the life of the trucks that are supposed to be replaced that much longer. So what we're working on was getting quotes uh, for me to bring another um, consideration to you to consider pre-ordering, issuing POs for those FY23 trucks here sooner than later so that there's actually the potential to receive them and pay for them in FY23 and retire the other old units. So that's kind of precursor was coming up in anticipation to keep something like this from not happening again uh, with a 465 day time frame. So with, uh, with that in mind, um, so I do have a mistake on this memo in uh, kind of the emergency situation we were in and uh, our guys actually combed the entire country trying to find a truck that was already built that was available that we could purchase and bring right in. There isn't such a thing. We, um, we actually found this cab and chassis that is built and is available to go to the body um, supplier in order to put it together. So by hurrying on this and bringing it forward, we're able to take advantage of that cabin chassis and then get it, they're saying, by June. So at least it's, it's still a fair amount of time, but a lot better than, than the latter. So the mistake that we have on there is that we did not have tax included on that estimate. So um, after I answer any questions that you have, if, uh, if you decide to move to approve city contract, I would ask for um, to be amended with the amended amount not to exceed $330,936.31. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have.
<clears throat> Councilman Montoya. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Craig, I appreciate you answering my questions uh, prior to this meeting. Uh, do we have any idea what we might get for the old truck at auction? I'm just curious. The, the last auction, we actually did quite well because the whole country is scrambling for used stuff because nobody can get new stuff. Right. Um, guess, Justin? Just a ballpark? I won't hold you to it, I yeah, promise. I'm guessing uh, probably between 15 and 25. Okay. Thousand. I'm Justin with Fleet. Okay, thanks, Justin. I appreciate that. Um, the other question I had, uh, kind of along the um, second question that you're talking about, is there, I guess, kind of what I was broadly getting at, and maybe, Justin, this might be a question for you, too. I guess I just wonder, you know, given where we're at with supply chain issues right now, everywhere, um, is, there, is there ongoing identification we're doing at Fleet, not just with vehicles like, you know, trash trucks, but all of Fleet that might be useful to identify so that we're not caught in a situation where we've got a thing on its last legs, but, you know, we're waiting till June? So uh, usually we use a, a vendor out of Phoenix to uh, purchase this. Um, here we had to reach outside the, uh, the limits and it was back east to do that. Um, so we are uh, looking everywhere for it, you know, to, uh, to buy the equipment. Sure, but, but, but I mean, I guess, are we identifying other issues within our fleet that we have right now? I mean, is there, I imagine you have a standard operation procedure around that. We actually have a fleet Arb. Yeah, I was going to get the F the FARB wrong, but it's a fleet review board um, that involves almost every department that has a vehicle, if not every department that has a vehicle. That's correct. And they go over um, multiple times a year the condition of the fleet, the need for uh, new vehicles, what vehicles may be refurbished, and then from that, FARB review, we put together the capital plan for vehicle purchases annually. And, and that drives into our budgeting process? Yeah, it okay. drives into our budgeting process. And um, actually, FARB met two, three weeks ago about uh, the plan. Last week as well. Yeah, about plans for uh, the 2023 budget and what replacement vehicles we need, which uh, earlier today we had a discussion about the ladder truck. Um, knowing that within the next two years that needs to be replaced and something else needs to be put in service because after 25 years um, it can't be insured anymore or doesn't meet the certified. I certified for ISO requirements, I guess. Good to know. Thank you. Yeah. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Um, can you tell me what the tonnage or weight of this vehicle would be fully loaded? This is a considered a 10-wheel truck, so maximum gross weight on that is 54,000. Okay, thank you. Well, all I can say is I think reading the um, <clears throat> Daily Wall Street Journal uh, reports on uh, vehicles and the growing um, lead time to be able to uh, put all the components together and uh, have a delivered vehicle, especially these specialty vehicles, um, I think this uh, lag time is going to continue to grow. Yeah, I don't think it's going anywhere. So we have to really work that into our budgeting process. And it's good to hear that uh, maybe we can um, dispose of the previous vehicle uh, with enough um, income or dollar amount to cover the tax. I was going to say it'll cover the tax. Yeah, almost exactly. <laughs> so I think this is uh, another situation where uh, it's a necessary vehicle. Um, not the best situation, but uh, taking advantage of what we have available now, I think, is uh, is what we have to do. Do we have any other um, concerns or comments? Any uh, public? No, Mayor. Input? Okay, I'll entertain a motion here. Mayor, I move that we approve city contract number 2022-144 with the amended amount as presented. Second. I have a motion and second. Any further discussion? Please vote. Pass the 7 0. Thank you. All right. 10 E. Approval of Community Development Department to apply for Heritage Fund grant for funding in fiscal year 2023. Good evening. I'm Kat Moody. I come before you today as the Historic Preservation Specialist for the city. And 
and this is a request to apply for a grant. And because of the grant cycle and the timeline, the application for the grant actually takes place before the budget process for the city begins. Uh, but the actual award of the grant will take place in the budget year that would start in July. Uh, the grant, uh, if awarded to us, would come back to council for approval before we were to accept it. So um, who can apply for this grant is incorporated municipalities, counties, state agencies, tribal government, and nonprofits. And in order to qualify for this grant, the, the property or subject matter related to the grant activities have to be national register el eligible. So um, the funds for the grant, it's a match grant. So the Heritage Fund uh, was originally uh, something that was approved by the voters back in 1990, and it was funded out of the Arizona lottery. Uh, the grant was uh, swept from the budget in 2008, and it was just reinstated in 2020. And it's not funded out of the lottery right now, but there's a motion, uh, there's a state bill to fund it and return it to lottery funds. So the grants, uh, the funds pay 60%, and then the city's match is 40%. Part of that 40% match can be in-kind services. Uh, so we actually have um, already begun work on, on some of these projects, which I'll get to in just a moment. And so in-kind can be actual hours that I've spent starting the projects and documented and working on those. So that's actual just staff time that can be billed as part of that 40% of city match. So this is the, uh, the timing cycle. The round two for this grant is due a week from today, and I'm prepared to submit uh, for that cycle if, uh, if it's approved to apply for the grant. Round three will be a little bit later in the spring. So these are the projects we're looking to use the grant funds for. We have a historic property owners uh, guide, which we hand out to historic property owners, realtors, um, uh, other uh, organizations that deal with uh, historic properties. It's an educational tool. It helps people who are considering purchasing a historic property or who already own one navigate what are the requirements for maintaining the property and going through our process for approvals. So this guide dates from two, um, 2008. Uh, originally, the city paid $4,000 for the creation of the guide. The guide needs very minor updates, and then it's really pretty much printing costs at this point. We're out of these guides. I got a call yesterday from somebody asking if he can get one, and I said, nope, it's available on the website electronically, but we don't actually have the hard copy <coughs> um, booklets. It's a 20-page booklet. The second project is a historic preservation master plan update, and this is the uh, cover of the current historic preservation master plan, which was, as you can see, there's a small note at the top that says adopted in 1998. <laughs> it has not been updated since 1998. Uh, it's served us well, but it's out of date. It references old zonings that haven't been in place for over a decade. It was produced on a typewriter. Um, so the work that, that's begun is scanning this document, optical character recognition, um, getting the text from the OCR process, correcting the text, and then removing the old zoning uh, sections. And so that work's already taken place. So that's something I've been working on uh, in between my other projects. Part of what needs to happen to get this plan up to date is to incorporate all the districts that have been 
formed and approved since that plan was put in place. So the ones outlined in red here are not even in the plan right now. So these districts need to be brought into the plan so that we have guidelines for all our historic districts in that plan. And then the associated costs for the update are um, to engage either a consulted or a contracted temp employee to uh, incorporate the newer districts, cross-reference and research with current standards and other well-received plans uh, around the region, uh, reformat the plan to streamline it. It's very large for its, um, the, what it's covering, and it could be um, streamlined. And then public outreach and incorporation of public outreach and then publication and any printing costs, although we don't print a huge number of copies of this plan. And with that, I will take any questions you might have. Councilman Montoya. Kat, thanks for the thoroughness of your presentation. Uh, I, I guess the question I have, um, what goes into the, like who is involved in the master plan uh, development part of that? Well, in 1998, it was pretty much handled by um, it was handled by my predecessor, uh, Nancy Burgess, and then it was contracted out uh, with Steve Adams, who's a local architect who had served years on the Preservation Commission, and so those two worked closely together. Together, and then it went for review through the Preservation Commission for additional comments. And that was the process that was taken forward, you know. At Back in 1998. 98, yeah. <laughs> and so the anticipation is we'll need some supplemental, you know, manpower to get us through that process. There are consultants who specialize just particularly in this type of work. Um, I mean, we're not looking at spending this much, but Tempe spending $250,000 to do the same thing, right, you know, currently. So, um, you know, we're looking at a maximum outlay of the 40,000 is the city match. It, it will be less than that because I'm looking at in-kind hours for my time. Uh, and then that includes both projects, both the homeowner's guide reprinting and the master plan update. And then just a last question. You mentioned those guides that we're out of now, the printing costs associated with those. Do you, do you have an, a ballpark on what those will cost? Well, printing costs have gone up substantially. Sure. So I did get um, you know, a, a quote uh, several years ago. It's going to be between two and $4,000, depending on how many we, we produce. Gotcha. And then do we like distribute those to places outside of the property owners? Like, do we keep some in like the chamber of commerce or anything like that? Or? Uh, not normally in the chamber. They're, they're available here. And then when I do educational outreach to the realtor um, uh, meetings, then I distribute them there uh, and other sort of public outreach efforts. Like we have them when we do the historic home tour and so those are places that are available to other people. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, very good. Any other questions? <clears throat> well, full disclosure, my wife does collect old typewriters. <laughs> but I don't think that's a conflict of interest in this okay. particular okay. situation. But um, being a liaison to the Historic Preservation Commission for a number of years and representing the city and the state uh, uh, historic um, preservation conference. Um, we should be very, very proud of uh, the the commission, Cat's work on the commission, and its ability to keep our uh, historic downtown core um, the historic place that it has been and and um, will continue to be. So uh, this is something I certainly would support. I'll entertain a motion. Mayor, I move to approve Community Development Department application for a Heritage Fund grant. Second. second. I have a motion is second. Any further discussion? Please vote. Passes 7 0. Thank you. Thank you, Kat. Approval for the fire department to apply for a three to four year no match Federal Emergency Management Administration staffing for adequate fire response grant. 
Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, my name is Tom Knapp. I'm the Deputy Chief and Fire Marshal. Um, my first time presenting in front of you, and I apologize without the help of uh, Sarah, we wouldn't have been on this agenda. This was a really tight one, and we have eight days to perform. So uh, back in May 11th, 21, uh, the council approved the fire department through an action that allowed us to apply for grants. However, the SAFER grant is not one of those, and for a good reason. There, there's a long-term commitment typically, typically with that. The SAFER is the Staffing for Adequate Fire and Emergency Response. Um, the SAFER grant changes every year. Um, they add match grants. They add timelines that you have to keep the folks employed. Um, this year... As you know, with the grants, everything's off the table. There's a zero match. Um, there is no retention required. Um, and they do not have, uh, they cover everything from the, the cost of employment except for equipment. Um, so what we are doing is we looked at uh, several things. The key points, again, it opened up on uh, January 3rd, closes February 4th. We have eight days. Uh, we've done a little work in the background, uh, quite a bit actually. Um, the awards are announced anywhere from May to June. Um, so we have to forecast whether we're, we're going to uh, allocate the uh, equipment that would be about $150,000 to outfit the folks that we're asking for. We believe that part of that comes through attrition. However, attrition itself is not included in the grant. Um, however, they look at a roster that we turn in with the grant and then a roster as we go on through the grant. Um, we have some correction, corrections to our memo. Um, first of all, the grant amount that I put in there was 2.7 million. That is unmatched. Um, we have corrected that and downsized that to 2 million, um, <coughs> $9,059. Uh, we took out the 3% administrative fee and worked with finance um, to get get the employment numbers and uh, what our benefits packages were or projected to be. Um, and they did a great job helping us out in a very short time. So what we are asking for is for the council's approval for us to apply for the grant. Um, it would, of course, come back before council prior to acceptance with full disclosure of all expected costs and commitments from the, the city. Um, and we project that to be the $2 million plus the uh, $150,000 for expected equipment. One of the other things I need to point out is over the next four years, the department is going to see eight employees retire. And that's not a maybe retire. They're in the drop. Um, so that, that's a commitment that we have to forecast for. Um, if we can get those folks on board now, we will be right where we ended when this is over in four years with, without any progression. One thing that I have noticed uh, in my time in the fire service, I've never seen anything like we're, we're seeing in public safety now, and that is a de decline in folks getting into the profession of public safety. Um, this is across the board. Uh, it's amazing to hear. You know what's happening with the police, um, but now it's really hitting the fire departments and the EMS. That's one of our challenges with AMR and our provider here in town. Um, out of the last year, we had, normally we would have about 100 applicants for a firefighter vacancy. We had 30 applicants. Uh, it's not for a lack of marketing at all. Um, it's just that what brings folks to do this work, the workforce has changed. Uh, we are no longer seeing the 20 year commitment we're seeing people work for five, 10, seven years and get out of the system. As you know, the PSPRS system changed, which was an incentive. It's no longer that. Um, you can get a better program. So we have some challenges ahead of us. Um, and this is one way that we can kind of bridge that gap um, if we're able to get the grant. But again, no guarantees. So any questions? Councilman Montoya. Uh, Deputy Chief, thank you for your thorough explanation of the uh, process. Uh, I think you answered a lot of my questions, but I just want to restate and make sure I'm tracking with what you're saying. So it sounds like this would allow us 
to apply for a grant that would allow us to then hire eight new personnel for fire, Department of Prescott, <coughs> which would solve the forecasted eight retirements that are going to happen in the next few years here. And um, doing so, uh, we're under no contingency if for some reason to, to, get, to maintain that hiring. Basically, all the strings that are normally attached to a grant like this uh, don't exist. Am, am I getting that correct? Uh, Mayor Good, members of the council, Councilman Montoya, um, you are getting it correct. Um, a little conv convoluted information where this money is coming from. 530,000, 560,000 is available in this grant. Um, 200 million of that is also from the ARPA. So they've taken from that as well uh, and they're putting okay. it in. So they're, they're moving the money, uh, which took the strings off, as we've seen earlier in your discussion, your work study. Um, there is no commitment for retention, is correct. Um, we can't use this for attrition. However, we can predict the attrition. Sure. And we know that it's coming. Uh, what we're looking at is literally in, in a matter of two months, by the time this grant's in, we will have two vacancies. Oh, wow. And I need six more folks just to keep uh, PTO use um, what w the impact of overtime, if you look at our overtime numbers, which will be available, we're talking large numbers um, of folks that are held over. Um, in the public service, in our, our job, we can't just go home because we have a commitment at home. So we are force hiring, making folks stay home, miss appointments, because we have nobody that can work. We have folks that are working 72 hours straight, 96 hours straight. When times got lean in the 80s, 72 was it, and you had to tap out and go home for 12, and then you came back. We've got folks that don't go home. Now, that leads to burnout. That leads to a lot of things. Um, dysfunction, uh, disgruntled employees. I mean, you can go on and on. You've all read it, learned it, lived it. The reality is how do we get ahead of that is we provide enough folks to allow them to have more than two people off per day. You have 20 people working per day and two call out, two go to school, you're paying overtime for four, if you can get them. And we're not staffing at the national standard of four, we're staffing at three. So we don't have a fluff pattern where we can keep the truck running we start browning out the truck. That's not a good thing. It's, it's showing less service. Um, it's a management issue, and it's for, forecasting. We have to forecast for what we're about to see. Um, this is one tool to do it. The, the sad thing is the fire service only has real four major grants that are available. The SAFER grant, which is staffing, that's it. Then you have the assistance to firefighters grant, which is equipment, programs. And then you have the fire prevention grant. And then you have a few small grants that are out there. There's just not a lot. And to find those, you need a grants person that's in it all the time um, that you can tie to these programs. We're hurting in a lot of areas right now. Plans review. I'm in charge of plan, re plan review operations and acting right now. So when you ask me if I've seen, I, if I've seen the plat, no, I haven't. Um, I'll be honest, I don't have time to see all that. I have one plans reviewer right now because the other one's out on industrial from climbing ladders, getting into these buildings and looking at things. We have a lot to look forward to and try to fix. And it's not gonna happen by waiting. So um, I've had an incredible crew put this together in half an hour. <laughs> um, thanks, Sarah. And then two days where it was work days where finance, everybody jumped in to actually try to solve the number issue. And when it comes down to, well, we don't know if there's going to be a COLA or not, it doesn't matter. We have to gear for it. It doesn't mean they get it. But we have to cover it. If we cover it in here, their benefits are covered. 
their payroll's covered. That's $2 million we don't have to look at out of our general fund. So well, I've done these before. Your, uh, I'm sorry. Your justification, your presentation, I think this is another example of um, how much we need um, additional fire capability as we continue to grow. Um, we're not even talking about the additional vehicles and the brick and mortar uh, locations that we're going to have to plan for. But by gosh, if we have an opportunity like this to be able to uh, be a little bit ahead of the demands for personnel, um, we absolutely need to jump on it and, and support that uh, additional um, staffing so that we don't have to worry about trying to uh, backfill some of those um, positions after they, they do leave for whatever reasons. So <clears throat> certainly something that I would 100% support. Any other comments or questions? Any comments from the public? No, Mayor. I'll entertain a motion. Mayor, I move that we approve the fire department application for a FEMA safer grant. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Please vote. Pass the 7 0. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Chief. Thank you very much, Tom. Legislative update. Hello, Mayor and Council. I know it's been a long day, so I'll make this quick. I'm Tyler Goodman with the City Manager's Office, and this is the first real legislative update, I guess, for this session. Just to dive in, there's been 930 bills introduced as of yesterday, and no, I have not read all of them yet, and probably never oh, will. Uh, a good thing to note, deadlines to introduce bills are January 31st for the Senate and February 7th for the House, and that's important because We'll know basically the universe of bills that we're dealing with after that point, but we haven't reached it yet. As far as topics that are of most either noteworthy or of most concern, number one is affordable housing. It seems that passing legislation regarding this topic is one of the, uh, the bigger priorities and probably the bigger issues of this session. No specific bill has come up yet to really encompass what I, I think stakeholders are seeing down there. One concerning concept that's come up is buy right development, which that goal is to remove a lot of the local oversight if there are certain requirements that are being met. So it could potentially exclude P and Z council, public input from the process. It would make it largely administrative. Um, again, we don't have a lot of details. That's just a concept that's been talked about down there and that may they may try to focus a bill or two around that. Obviously, the league is aware of that. They're involved in the stakeholder meetings with the different legislators. They're very much opposed to that, as are all cities and towns. And so that's something that we are keeping an eye on. And if something does come up, we'll know about it very quickly and bring it forward. Next, short-term rentals. There's a lot of short-term rental bills. However, none of them are really addressing the core issues that cities have brought forward for the past three or four years. So the league is neutral on some and, and just doesn't, um, it doesn't really weigh in on a lot of them because they make some marginal changes, but nothing that's really satisfying the goal. And if, in my mind, if you wanna talk about affordable housing, you also have to talk about short-term rentals and how some of the communities in the state are, are so filled with them that it's really cut down on their housing stock. So we'll see what comes from that discussion on short-term rentals. Uh, there's another from last year. This is a carryover bill, 1245. It has to do with establishing a, a retail license for tobacco sales. It would preempt cities from regulating sales and marketing of tobacco and vaping products, which is the biggest concern we have about that. And it would place some restrictions on zoning limit distances for the sale from schools and parks, those things that are normally in our regulations. Um, that has not been scheduled yet for a committee, so we'll keep an eye. 2316, guns in public buildings is also a carryover, a repeat from last year. It would preempt cities from prohibiting firearms for those with CCW permits, unless we provide metal detectors and personnel to make sure that people coming in the building don't have a weapon. I think we, I can't remember what we estimated last year for the cost of hiring people and the equipment. It was in the hundreds of thousands just to make that work. So it's an unfunded mandate. Uh, it really has nothing to do with, with what the state needs to worry about. So. That is scheduled for tomorrow in committee, um, but I, I don't think there's a real concern that it'll get very far in the session, but we'll keep it on our list. 
1275 is fireworks. This is something the league has been working on during the interim, and now it's a bill. It would allow cities to ban fireworks between 11 p.m. and 8 a.m. on all days except for New Year's and 4th of July between 11 p.m. and 1 a.m. And that's been a big deal for a lot of cities around the state, especially with fire concerns. And then there are several bills that deal with PSPRS. None of them are, are earth shattering, but they do make some tweaks at the margin um, or around the margins. I think probably the most applicable to us is 1084 that certain of their annual reports will be provided to us by December 1st rather than the 31st of each year. So that would help us with that information. And then 2035 appropriates over 1.5 billion from the state general fund to PSPRS to reduce the state's unfunded liability for their agencies. That'd be nice to take care of yourself. Yeah, Wouldn't that really? be nice? <laughs> yeah. And that is all I have for now, unless you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those. Uh, can you, if that uh, fireworks uh, bill has any legs, do you think uh, we can get Barry to uh, add an amendment to allow the uh, courthouse lighting to be uh, excluded from those, or included with those two dates? Yeah, why not? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Work on that. Five billion. <laughs> All right, I think that uh, completes right. our evening. Thank you very much, you. Tyler. And uh, uh, unless there's anything else, this uh, meeting is adjourned. I'm just glad that the Galvin Grand Big Area Planning.